um, being, I think we've got most people on Zoom, but round the table here, um, I have Deputy Mayor Free, um, Councillor Young, and supported um, by our officers. So I'm, and then I see we've got a few people, some councillors online um, too. So um, thank you all. Now, I, I'm not sure what's been, um, what you're aware of. We were going to have a bit of a catch up at four o'clock, but we're not going to do that now. So if you've got that in your diaries, you now have an extra 45 minutes back in your life. And I'm sure you'll be very pleased about that. Um, you never know. We might even finish before four, but who knows? We, we actually, uh, uh, there's not a lot of time for each um, CCO. So um, I'd say we will probably go to the four o'clock. Um, um, and that means that we are at a tight time frame. So if um, my colleagues could keep um, their questions to the um, pertinent points. Um, I know a lot of the CCOs are doing some really interesting and um, things. And um, I know they're always willing to um, take a visit from us um, and to find out in more detail about what's going on in their own um, organization. So if we can keep things specifically to questions to what we have in our papers, that would be great um, and help us keep on track. Um, so um, we, I believe we have Wellington NZ first up. Um, welcome, John. Welcome, Tracy. And um, um, if you would, um, um, I think you've got a presentation to start no. with. You haven't? No. You're just going to talk, are you, John? Uh, Tracy and I will both okay. talk. <laughs> okay. All Brief, right. Briefly. Okay. Uh, well, your, your task, and thank you, Diane, for, for the introduction and for the opportunity. Um, there is quite a bit of material that has been circulated to councillors, as I understand it, which includes a presentation of our quarterly report, uh, and the financial analysis that Wellington City has done uh, of our performance uh, over the uh, past year. Uh, our uh, accounts are still being audited, so, uh, so that's why you're not getting more detailed financial papers. They'll come in uh, due course. I just had four or five points that I wanted to make, and no doubt Tracy will want to make just a few more. Um, the first is that what the last period demonstrates to us, and it's a subject that I've raised with you before, is the resilience of the economy of this place. Um, it's very, very easy to talk it down, but the truth is that what we've seen in terms of job creation, what we've seen in terms of GDP growth, I know that's not the full picture, but nonetheless, that's a, a lens to be thinking about at these uh, challenging times. Uh, what we've seen in terms of a consistent uh, reduction in the number of people who are looking for financial support as a result of being out of work, uh, notwithstanding that number is still well ahead of it, well, where it was pre-COVID, uh, you know, does demonstrate the reality that when you're the capital city with the support of government here, uh, when you have professional services activity like we do to support uh, government, and when you have a vibrant technology sector of the kind that we have here, uh, you do have a diversified and sustainable economy. Now, of course, I haven't talked about construction or any of the others uh, that might underpin that. So that's the first message that I think you can take from all the material uh, that is in front of you. Uh, the second message is the reality that for some sectors of the economy, that is not the case. Uh, and those are obvious in terms of accommodation and tourism, in terms of events uh, and retail. Uh, and the impact of COVID there is tough uh, and you see it and you can see it today as you could see it uh, last year. And frankly, the extent of differences in um, some of the metrics that we use in terms of uh, tourist numbers or uh, customer spend or things of that kind literally depend on when we've gone in or out of lockdown uh, at this year and last year. Uh, so you'll see some pretty volatile swings in there. All it really tells you is if you're in those sectors, uh, life is incredibly tough. The third thing that I'll take from what the material that's in front of you is that people are resilient and that people have used this opportunity to rethink their businesses and their, re and their business models, to look ahead into the uh, carbon neutral uh, environment that we are looking to, uh, to re-imagine um, uh, what they are doing. And the reason that I'm confident in saying that to you is the experience which is described in our, uh, our presentation pack, 
uh, of both our, um, our tourism, uh, sustainable tourism accelerator, which has just been completed and which is run by uh, uh, Creative HQ, uh, and the very significant um, climate change accelerator that we ran with a series of companies uh, based here in Wellington that resulted in them raising capital uh, for their initiatives like Tasman Iron, which I think is the one that's showcased uh, in the presentation and is no doubt known to many of, uh, of you. Uh, and so I think that is an, a remarkable thing that in face of the sort of financial pressures and other pressures that people are confronting, they're spending time thinking about their business and the future of their business and how they can get it to carbon neutral, how they can make it more sustainable, how they can innovate. Uh, if we've got those sort of people in our city and in our community, uh, then uh, we've got reason for, for real um, optimism. Uh, obviously, the last point that I'll make is that uh, the period that we've, uh, that we've been through, I think, demonstrates why uh, Wellington NZ exists uh, and why it adds value. Uh, and that's, I mean, the reality is obviously on the events side of our business, it's been very challenging, although we have been able to bring events here uh, in the um, COVID allowing times. Uh, we lost two rugby tests, we lost, wow, we've lost a few things that have been quite important to the city. Uh, but, but I think you can see it quite clearly that the Love Local campaigns and the work that have been done around that, um, the ability, the processes that we've made to try and um, uh, draw attention to the opportunities to support the hospitality sectors um, with various campaigns over this time. Uh, the marketing that we've done to attract visitors to our region uh, from places that where they're allowed to, uh, uh, to travel uh, have all added value. And I think particularly I'd draw your attention to the material in the pack that is the analysis by MBM, which is a sort of big media agency, of the amount of out of town spend, consumer spend, which has been driven by marketing campaigns undertaken uh, by Wellington NZ. Now I know that you'll say, some of you will say that's alchemy and uh, it's all very mysterious and it's a bit of a black box, but they're a reputable sort of outfit, uh, MBM, and they've been doing this stuff for a long time. Uh, and what they're saying uh, is that what we have been doing has made a difference for our city and for our region. Uh, and for example, I mean, we spent about $3.3 .3 million, and they're saying that's driven about 200 and something million dollars of consumer spend. Now, that seems to me like a pretty dramatic number. Huh? Um, it is a pretty dramatic number, but that's what they're saying. And they're saying 68 million of that relates to tourism campaigns, and 62 million of that relates to major events campaigns. So, you know, every now and then you ask yourself the question, does marketing really shift the dial? Uh, the answer is it does. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to draw that to your attention. Um, other than that, there's heaps going on. There's heaps coming up. Uh, there's a, a very full book in the summer uh, of events and sporting events and music events and all of those sorts of things. There's a bit of a lull uh, right at the moment because of COVID and uncertainties and traffic lights and passes and all of that stuff uh, that we're all wrestling with. Um, but, uh, you know, looking forward, we are very optimistic uh, that the, the vibe will return to the city. Uh, the, um, the work we're doing across our region, actually, uh, gives us confidence um, that the region will continue to prosper as well. I'll stop there. I know you haven't got much time. Tracy, was there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, just one thing. Then quickly on a much more boring um, but probably also important note is the work that we've been doing um, under the auspices of the new regional leadership committee to lead the development of a regional economic develop uh, regional economic development plan um, and um, you know the, the the city's involved in that of course but I just want to note that because it does speak to the government's need for regionalism as a key to um, gathering central government investment, and we're well on the way with that. Happy to answer any questions about that too. Um, okay. Um, um, elected members, uh, questions? Uh, counts oh, um, Councillor for Simons. I'm taking a risk with my colleagues as we are trying to avoid asking lots of questions, but I did just <laughs> want to ask um, John and Tracy. Like, we're obviously in uncharted territory. Yeah. If you guys had a wider or different mandate, where else would you be looking in terms of kind of steadying the ship or keeping Wellington going uh, in the next wee while? 
I think I think it's about the scale of the impact that we can have. So so we don't have the balance sheet uh, or the P and L that the city has or that central government has. Uh, and obviously that means that we're always working, if we're working on our own, we tend to be working at the margins. I'm not saying it's not positive, but it's positive at the margins. Uh, and to have the impact that we would like to have, uh, we have to form coalitions of the willing. Now, normally that's reasonably straightforward because the city's pretty willing. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think if you just take a simple thing like um, the event space, uh, there's a lot we could do with our own venues. Um, for example, if we had the money to invest to make them more more fit for purpose to be attracting the music events that we know can be coming to the city over the next while, uh, there's a lot we could do perhaps more with um, with uh, Tarkin or other places coming on stream. So there's just one small snapshot uh, of where there are things we could do uh, to be even more impactful uh, than we are. Uh, in terms of... Um, uh, the development of uh, sort of business confidence. Uh, we would love to be telling the stories of business in the city in a far more powerful way. We are doing that with a new podcast. I'm, just the reason I raised this was to be able to insert this and relevantly into the answering this question. Um, there's a new podcast by um, uh, uh, Jihan uh, uh, Casanada, uh, who many of you will know. Uh, it's fabulous, fabulous stuff. So do, do find it and, and listen to the late of the first one, which is with... Um, um, uh, Richard Taylor, and it's great. Uh, so we are starting to tell those stories, but there's a lot more we could do, Councillor Simons, uh, in that space if we had a bit more uh, capacity. I don't see um, anybody else's hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Foon. Uh, kia ora kūrua. Um, thank you so much for all the mahi you're doing for the city. It, um, it is a really great read, and um, I know that John knows I'm excitable, so I'm trying to act very cool right now, uh, especially the initiatives around um, climate and um, yeah, enabling a low-carbon future for our businesses. It's really exciting. Um, but my question is around the economic well-being strategy and, and just that that's a really big opportunity for Wellington and Z to build the knowledge that you have through. Um, you know, it, so just are you, I'm just checking, I'm sure you are, but just that you're involved with that process and the strategy feels like it's shaping up to what you, you understand to be a good direction for our council and the city. Uh, the answer to that is yes and yes. Yeah, so I, I do think it's going in the right direction. Uh, and I think that the, um, the, the balance that is being struck uh, between inclusion and making sure that everybody can actually benefit from the work, uh, the underlying sort of economic process is, um, is commendable. Right, good. Okay, we'll look forward to uh, walking alongside you while that takes shape. Thank you. Councillor Condy. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on Tracy, your comments about the work happening at the regional level. And I guess kind of tying that together with Councillor Foon's question about our own um, economic wellbeing strategy that's going at the moment. Can you talk us through a bit of how the work is progressing at the regional level and how that's kind of tying in with the work that we're doing at the city level? Did you want me to answer that or do you want to talk to that, Tracy? I think the question is directed uh, to I you. Thought that I'm happy I thought, to. I thought you might lead by talking about the work that Stu and his team are doing. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so uh, what we're doing at the um, at the regional level uh, is that we are preparing a. We're basically taking all the regional economic plans, and there's there's about three hundred of them uh, across the region. With when you take, you know, various sector plans and industry transformation plans and uh, TA uh, plans and uh, Maori development plans, there's there's so there's a heap of uh, uh, plans already available, uh, and we're trying to distill those into a series of projects that we think are the most important uh, collect for the uh, for the region. Now, when I say we think. I don't mean that uh, Tracy and I are sitting there and opining on what the uh, uh, what the choices should be. We're we're running a um, consultative process across the region to identify those sort of top thirty or forty projects, and the reason we're doing that 
goes to my point about not being able to do things on our own. The reason we're doing it is to secure government funding, central government funding and support uh, for that suite of projects to be able to move them out from beyond, beyond ideas to actually uh, delivery. And we're trying to make sure that those are projects that can actually shift the dial for long-term sustainable uh, economic um, benefit for communities across uh, our region. So that's the work that is currently underway. Uh, there's a hui on the uh, 6th of December, so uh, some of you may have been invited to that. It'd be great to see some of you there. Uh, the mayors, I think, are, are, are all attending. Uh, and um, we're, we're looking to have that process complete uh, by uh, the end of this financial year. And, and obviously, part, one of the threads that we're drawing into that conversation is the work that uh, uh, Sean and the team are leading within uh, Wellington City Council um, around the new uh, economic wellbeing strategy. And just picking up both the climate and the wellbeing threads there, one of the tools that we're using as part of that process is the PRISM kind of lens for assessing projects. And I'm going to forget what all of those letters stand for, but they do bring in those ideas, including Māori enabling is, is, is the M aspect of it. Great, thank you very much. Councillor Day. Uh, that was uh, my original pātai, but um, I've got one that sort of follows on from what you just said there, Tracy, around the um, Māori economy. And just obviously we've got a paper coming up tomorrow um, which sort of addresses some opportunities for that. But just also what you're seeing locally, like it's still, I feel like it's still quite hard for mana whenua in Wellington to be participating in the Māori economy and um, to full potential at the moment and just what we could be doing to, to really support that. Uh, so the answer is, yes, it is quite hard uh, for many of those Maori businesses. I think the most important thing that the council can do, and of course we are doing it uh, in, in this city, uh, is uh, looking at our procurement policies and ensuring that we are uh, supporting our local businesses and particularly our Maori businesses um, in the uh, dis buying decisions that we make. Uh, when I look at the, um, the areas where there seems to be the most um, activity in, uh, around Māori business, uh, it's often in the context of uh, places like Porirua, uh, where they have made some quite deliberate decisions. So when I say they, it's not just the city, it's Ngāti Tōa as well, um, around the procurement policies that they are going to, uh, they are going to adopt. And I know we've got that here, so I'm not, this, that's not a... A, a, a drawing Porirua to be sort of competitive. Uh, it's simply that's one example where I see it happening. Uh, and uh, I think that's a, a, a significant uh, opportunity. Uh, there's lots of other things we need to do. Uh, we're doing a, a range of projects uh, with particularly uh, young Maori um, in parts of the region, uh, looking at developing entrepreneurial skills, for example. Uh, and to Councillor Simon's earlier question about scaling, one of the things I would be doing if I was investing more money is investing more money in that space and the pathways into employment and skills development, and particularly in the entrepreneurial space, uh, where I think there's huge potential. There's just so much talent uh, across that community. Yeah. And if I could just pick up and add that in that new uh, regional strategy leadership committee, that it's not the right name for it, Mana Whenua are represented on that, and we are starting to get really rich input in terms of the question that, that you're asking. Kia ora, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I'll just finish off with a last question. And, um, at more the bit of the pointy end, but this, the, you might have seen the statement of expectations, the paper that we have, um, and also that we're discussing tomorrow. How, have you seen the content of that in terms for Wellington NZ? No. Okay. okay. So um, I don't. I don't think so. I, I, I certainly don't have a paper called Statement of Intentions. Oh yes, yeah, Statement of Expectations for all of, of our. Um, and we're, we're um, um, it, it is something that we will be finalising. But I suppose one of the things I looked at, and I thought there was quite a strong emphasis on um, tourism, takina. Um, and um, you know, attracting you know destination marketing, um, not so much on growing you know, you know 
businesses here and, and perhaps the connection with our economic wellbeing strategy, albeit it hasn't been um, um, Seth, but maybe if I can get you to, I'll, I'll arrange for someone to send it to you, have a look at because I'm just quite interested just to get your, even if it's your initial thoughts on that. Um, is, is, it, is, it, is it targeted quite in the right area? Um, thank, yeah. you. Oh, I Diane, thank you. Last year, for the first time, we had a collaborative approach on our um, letter of expectation, and we appreciated that very much. It would be really good to repeat that this year, if possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you both um, for making the time available. And um, we will be in touch about sort of having a bit more in-depth conversation as well, um, just how we can all work better together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, now we have Basin Reserve Trust. Thank Hi, you. Hi. Hi. Afternoon. Welcome, and um, yes, yeah, so we've got um, roughly about 20 minutes, so um, you um, understand, yeah, just if you could just quickly take us through, and then perhaps we could allow some time for questions at the end. Brilliant. I'll just, um, I'll share my screen if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Can everyone see that? Yeah, getting some nods. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, thanks for thanks for having us. Um, I'm joined by Alan Isaac, chair of the BRT. So we're excited to sort of walk you through um, what's been happening around the venue um, and also the exciting things on the horizon. So, um, yeah, so we'll talk through the year that was, um, just give you a brief overview of the quarter one performance. Um, to the end of September, um, highlights for the trust and then what the future looks like as well. So in line uh, with the objectives of the trust and the statement of intent, the BRT performed well um, in a challenging year due to the emergence of COVID-19, obviously. Um, our non-financial performance targets were all exceeded, um, excluding community event days due to a timing issue with the hosting of the Peachy King concert in April. Um, pleasingly, we're proud that the venue continues to experience high attendance numbers across various events um, and access daily by a vast number of Wellingtonians. So just briefly, we held 50, uh, 50 cricket events, 26 other sports days, 111 practice days, 17 community events, 101 function days. Um, we had over 55,000 people in attendance with the various events throughout last year, um, and event income was higher than originally forecasted as well um, post-COVID. Uh, venue upgrades, so this includes uh, the continuation of the master plan projects um, and a key highlight from last year was the upgrade of the changing room facilities in partnership with Sport New Zealand and the Cricket World Cup to achieve gender neutral facilities to ensure we are a more um, inclusive venue as well. So this next slide basically captures um, what events we held last year, Bears of the Basin, um, firmly part um, of our events calendar now. Um, and last year we had a sold out crowd of over six and a half thousand people enjoy the beer, food and wine um, on a nice, nice sunny Wellington day. Peachy King, um, we welcome back a music festival to the venue for the first time um, in several years in April this year um, with over four and a half thousand people enjoying the homegrown sounds of some of our best Kiwi uh, female artists. International cricket, again, um, we hosted a test match against West Indies um, and welcomed back white ball cricket with an ODI against Bangladesh. Um, and I think, again, we showcase why the Basin Reserve is widely regarded uh, as the home of cricket in New Zealand with a near capacity crowd on all days enjoying uh, black cap victories. Domestic cricket, um, we're home to the Wellington Firebirds and Blaze. Uh, the basin was filled with fans for all Super Smash fixtures, um, culminating in a record crowd of over five and a half thousand people in attendance for the Super Smash Grand Final doubleheader in February this year. Um, the venue also hosted Plunkett Shield, Ford Trophy, and Halliburton Johnson Shield fixtures throughout the season. Junior sport, um, this is a favourite in the events calendar. Um, we hosted junior winter sport in partnership with Wellington Rugby and Capital Football, which saw 132 games and over 2,600 junior participants experiencing sport on the infamous famous, uh, uh, Basin Field uh, with some very envious parents on the sideline, I'm sure. Functions, um, the BRT continues to enjoy a strong relationship with Kapura and Black and Gold, 
um, with over 100 fu uh, functions held last year, including the venue being utilized as a blood donor center for four weeks. So this year, our quarter one summary, um, cricket events, we've had, uh, we've had one, it was delayed due to, um, due to the COVID-19 um, outbreak again. Other sports events, we exceeded this target due to extending out junior um, rugby and football into, the, into quarter one. Community events, uh, we didn't have any scheduled uh, because of COVID-19. Practice facility usage, again, we're on target. Um, Firebirds commenced training at the venue in September and they've been joined by the Blaze um, pathway teams and visiting teams as well. And functions, pleasingly, uh, Black and Gold have been able to utilize the function space at the venue um, due to other uh, venues being unavailable. Financially, uh, quarter one reflects a period of minimal activity for the Basin um, Reserve Trust. So expected income was lower than forecasted due to a delay in invoicing for the deposit relating to the Bears at the Basin event, which will now hopefully be reflected in quarter three. Um, there was additional unbudgeted expenditure for a full building wash um, for the RA Vance Stand, Player Civilian and Groundsman Cottage as part of the maintenance plan, and depreciation was reviewed and rates increased for the assets that have been upgraded by the Council. Uh, forecasted year-end position looks stable, but again, significant risk remains regarding events and ongoing COVID-19 interruption. So we move now to, um, to the highlights. Um, so we've secured a naming rights partner um, after an extensive three-year search with over 70 businesses approached. Um, the trust have finally secured Cello as the, as the naming rights partner on a two-year term. Um, this partnership has seen the network upgraded for the venue completed in October um, to improve connectivity and enhance it, uh, the event experience for all users. This is a giant leap forward for the venue as we seek to remain modern and ultimately better connected uh, to our users. The master plan, uh, so the trust remains committed to working with the council and obviously Warwick Hayes on the redevelopment of the basin and infrastructure upgrades. So as you can see from the pictures, work has commenced on the following. So the media box extension um, in the RA Vance stand, which is coming along nicely. The perimeter fence um, and gate upgrade. So it opens up the whole venue. If you're, um, if you're driving around the venue, you can see um, what a difference that makes. And then the to uh, embankment toilet upgrades, which is, um, which is ongoing. Other key highlights include a new cycle parking area located near the northern entrance in an attempt to promote alternate transport options for people attending events, which will be a nice addition. And this outlines our commitment to a venue uh, as a venue to align with the Get Wellington Moving strategy. Um, additionally, our aim to be an inclusive and welcoming venue for all users will be enhanced by the long awaited upgrades to the embankment toilets. Um, this will see the introduction of a public facing accessibility to toilet with 24 seven access built into the Northern toilet block, which is facing Kent Terrace. Um, and this also includes two other uni, unisex toilet facilities with 24 seven access. Um, each toilet block will have in venue accessibility toilets and we'll see a 200% increase in female toilets from six to 18. So overall, there is an increase in toilet facilities from 43 to 57 and an increase in public female only toilets from 16 to 34. And more broadly, five out of the six accessibility toilets are family friendly, and there are three unisex facilities for public use. So enough about toilets. Um, with these projects set to be completed early in the new year, the trust is now looking ahead to future projects, which include the picket fence, uh, fence upgrade, permanent broadcast towers, site screen upgrades, ground lighting to enhance venue safety, and additional storage areas. Accompanying this is the extensive maintenance program to ensure the basin remains one of the most picturesque venues uh, in the world. From a revenue point of view, um, the trust continues to explore revenue generation and commercial opportunities. And we partnered with Parkable regarding usage of the car park at the back of the RA Vance during the quieter months of this year, which was hugely successful. So as the venue develops, so too does the commercial opportunities. And we're trying to think of new and creative ways to keep moving the venue forward while maintaining and respecting what the basin and the venue was all about. The future for the trust. So um, on the horizon, the New Zealand Cricket Museum is set to reopen. Um, COVID hasn't been kind to the museum with two false starts in two years, but there does seem to be light at the end of the tunnel with the museum set to reopen its doors to the public in December this year. Um, this is situated in the old pavilion stand and the exhibition is truly world-class, modern and innovative. So this will be a welcome addition and will bring even more people to the venue itself. Um, the museum continues to face financial challenges, but the trust is determined to complete stage one, which is reopening 
and transition into stage two and three to bring to life the digital museum and the Hall of Fame concepts. Um, the museum will be a great addition to the cultural heartbeat of our capital and a nice addition to the must see and do list in Wellington. So just a special shout out to, um, to Sarah and Experience Wellington for their ongoing support there as well. Other events, um, the venue uh, will have one of its biggest periods ever with confirmation of a test match in February when the Black Caps host South Africa, a full domestic cricket calendar for the Firebirds and Blaze um, and hosting the Bears at the Basin event, which has now been postponed until April uh, next year, as well as uh, squeezing in some junior winter sport at the back end. But the big one is that we'll host the first ever ICC Cricket World Cup fixtures at the venue, as Wellington is one of the host cities for the Women's World Cup um, held here in March 2022. So originally scheduled for 2021, the event was postponed due to COVID-19, which worked out well for the Basin, as we now have a favourable event schedule with seven fixtures, kicking off with the big one, New Zealand versus Australia, and finishing with a semi-final. This is a truly global event and the Trust is working closely with all parties involved to ensure we execute a truly memorable World Cup. And if the borders are open, then this presents a bigger opportunity for, for visitation to Wellington as the capital, capital is essentially home to the Australian women's team and will naturally attract big crowds as one of the best and well-known teams in the world. Um, the Basin wants to be the most attended venue throughout the World Cup, so we're looking forward to support Wellingtonians, uh, to support from Wellingtonians. It has also uh, been noted that the relationship formed with Wellington NZ as the host city lead is the strongest in the country. So thanks to John and his team for their ongoing support. The Cricket World Cup is also an opportunity for the venue to reevaluate our sustainability plans. And we're working closely with Black and Gold regarding minimizing waste. We're now engaging with Wellington City Mission, Soup Kitchen, Kibosh Food Rescue, and the free store Re Leftover Food, and also reevaluating our rubbish and recycling processes. We are um, we're also aiming to upgrade venue signage to ensure we're a bilingual venue in line with our inclusive venue goals. Um, so additionally, I'd just like to, to mention the support from the wider CCO group as I've enjoyed the strategic discussions that are happening and further understanding the role that the BRT plays. I've especially enjoyed those trips to the zoo. Um, but yeah, Wellington Inc is in good hands and I know the future looks bright when there are such incredible people involved. So thanks for taking me under your wings and showing me what it's all about. Um, so, yeah, just open to, to questions now. Um, thank you, Liz. Now, we have, um, I'll ask a question first, and I'll go to Councillor Young, then Deputy Mayor Free. Um, so, one of the things that we've got as a council is re looking at our CapEx program. That what we wanted to spend this year is, uh, or this coming year, is challenged by the availability of um, resources and materials. Are you facing that at this stage? With with some of the programs that you were talking about or upgrades? Yeah, we've obviously um, had slight delays in the works program due to availability of steel um, effectively for the toilet box. Um, but we have been working closely with Warwick Hayes and the council just around um, making sure that those projects are done and dusted by the be beginning of February um, in line with hosting international cricket events and the World Cup. So it has been delayed, but um, we obviously understand why. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Young? Um, thank you very much. What I'm interested in is what is Cello, your new sponsor? <laughs> we get that a lot. It's, a, um, it's basically a, um, a network connectivity um, company um, who work with Wi-Fi um, and the likes, cloud connectivity, all of that. Okay, um, so no one will get up to modern technology. The appropriate association, new business, that's great, that's, thank um, you that uh, competes with Spark, but it's a Wellington owned business. Um, and the owners and shareholders are passionate Wellingtonians and passionate about sport. So as Liz said in her introduction, uh, they have upgraded the Wi-Fi connectivity uh, for the ground as well. So we, we saved a bunch of costs and uh, secured a, a sponsor who's very supportive of the city and the ground and you know understands the, the history, et cetera. Thank you, and it's, you. It, 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 is, it does seem very fitting, and I think it was well worth the wait by all accounts, so thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor Free. 
Yeah, I, re I agree. I think it is a good, it's a good fit. Um, Basin Reserve's round and so are cello, so I like that. Um, <laughs> I am very, very pleased to hear about 24-7 access to the toilets. Thank you very much, because I go right back to the Basin Reserve master plan that actually was floated when I first came to council. It's sort of about six years ago now, or maybe even seven. Um, but again, I'm coming back to the, um, the principle of the history of the Basin Reserve being a reserve for the public. And so, again, about that 24-7 access that was also promised with the master plan. Um, I realise 24-7 might be a bit ambitious, but public access um, yeah, to the grounds, and I think it was contingent on security lighting and um, better lighting and security cameras. So I was disappointed not to see them mentioned, but Warwick tells me they are still happening. Can I ask more about that project, please? Well, um, certainly uh, Warwick has uh, more of the detail, but uh, we, we are getting a report um, to advise uh, the trustees, essentially. Um, we had this discussion with the mayor on, on Friday, and uh, Warwick explained that he had had a discussion with you on the matter as well. So um, it's still <laughs> on the agenda. As an aside, uh, the trustees have just come from a presentation with uh, Get Willie moving, and it's, it's quite interesting to get an appreciation uh, of the various options and what that would do to access in and around the ground as well. But you know, we're, we're very conscious of the 24-7 issue, um, but we're obviously also very conscious of making sure that uh, the public are safe. Yeah, I, I get that, but um, we can't guarantee safety all the time, but we can. Yeah, we we yeah. have, um, uh, we're regularly um, incurring costs uh, because of graffiti, but we've also had two incidents of damage to the ground. Uh, for example, a group of people thought it was a fun place to ride their scooters around mm -hmm. and so forth. So, you know, there are there are a number of issues. And uh, as I said at the outset, and as you know, we're taking advice. So um, at the moment, can you tell me what, how, what hours it is open to the public? Because it is a pretty important thoroughfare. Yeah, so I think it's open. I think the gates open at seven in the morning. I think they close at 11 at night, I think. Oh, is it okay? At one point it was about 9.30, but 11 is good. Yeah, and I think it's been extended out. And it's, oh, it's okay. also relevant, of course, at the moment it is a construction zone and it has been a construction zone yeah. um, regularly uh, in previous times. So there's, there's clearly issues uh, associated with that as well. But I do thank you for keeping it open most of the time. It's quite, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, it's really, really good to have this update. I do ask Warwick about it regularly, <laughs> but thank you. Thanks. And um, we're fortunate we've also got, I think, Councillor for Simons, you're on the trust oh, of Sean. So he I'm should not be more, but I'm still a big supporter. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Thank so you. Councillor Rush will probably, could also act as a conduit if you've got any sort of other questions in that area as well. Can I ask one more just about the Let's Get Welly Moving project? Because, of course, it's a really different um, uh, proposal now from what it was with the bridge. Um, is the trust generally um, comfortable? It would, um, it, it, I think the answer to that is yes. We li literally met at uh, 11 o'clock today, so we haven't actually reconvened as a group, but the, um, the reactions were positive. So it, it creates a number of opportunities for us at the northern end of the ground um, that potentially gives us a little bit more space, better access, safer access. Um, there are some risks to us in terms of... Um, what might happen or need to happen at the southwest corner um, where the nets are and the groundsman shed at the moment, it sounds like, um, depending on the detail down the line, they may need to take a little bit uh, of the ground. So there's some issues there. But in, in summary, um, Councillor Simons, I think we were, we were positive about the opportunities. And if you like, that there was little downside or little risk um, to, to maintaining the asset that we have. Thank you. Um, thank you. And just for those online, I apologise as chair, I've got my back to the camera, but um, um, I think it's just the way this meeting room is set up. It's, it's a bit difficult to um, um, keep swivelling and that. So apologies for, for my back talking to you. Okay, so, um, th uh, um, so thank you, Alan and um, Liz. And so now we have Wellington Zoo. I see we've got Karen and um, Craig online. Yoriko, tell everybody. 
Kia ora, um, Craig here. Just first uh, slide really is um, our new, our newest addition, the newest member of the of the zoo community, which is um, Sally's baby. Uh, yet to be determined what the sex is, but Mum's keeping it uh, super close. Uh, as usual, uh, I'll touch on some of the stuff, and and Karen will uh, also. Uh, briefly talk to our presentation and then happy to answer uh, questions. So next slide, please. Just gives our strategy, uh, 2019 to 2023. Um, I'm sure you'll have seen this before, but this is how we operate and um, what we look to, to achieve and the values with which we look to, to make um, those uh, successes and, and, and processes within the zoo. If I can look back in the next slide as our annual report, just looking backwards, um, and again, you can see where we operate under the themes of, of our strategy. But I think I'll also do some, just touch on three uh, highlights of, of the report, really, and, and three different themes. Uh, one is community engagement, and you can see uh, how we've extended our charity partnerships to include Wellington City Mission and Changemakers. Um, we welcomed um, just under 230,000 people to the zoo, even in a, in a year um, significantly affected by COVID. And we continued to uh, reach out and protect where we could through the nest at Te Kohanga um, with treating 456 native animals. In terms of animals, the theme of, of environment, environmental performance is achieved, touched on by our achieving the Tuitu Carbon Zero certification out here in a row. And we've doubled the size of our uh, EV fleet uh, and we've launched the conservation strategy, Mutiaki Kilda. But also um, environmentally, but community outreach too is launching our Safe Cat and Safe Wildlife initiative to. Uh, not a Gareth Morgan approach, but actually looking to keep animals and uh, cats safe. And we supported the work of 13 partner organizations in the field. In terms of COVID, uh, we've achieved 19 out of the 20 uh, Wellington Zoo measures that were assessed around COVID. But we've also done things like develop behind the scenes experiences for many beasts. Uh, some bear and zookeeper for, the, for a day where we tried to modify how we operate to ensure that uh, our staff, our manahiri and, and our animals are safe. Um, touch on uh, quarter one, I'll let Karen take over on the next slide. Thanks, Craig. So just for quarter one, just a quick summary of what, what's been happening at the zoo. So obviously the theme going through this whole presentation from all of us will be the impacts of COVID. Um, we were obviously behind our targeted um, visitor numbers because of the COVID lockdown. However, financially, we are doing quite well against a budget operating deficit of 145K. We were actually only about $1,200 below our budget target. A lot of that is really to do with um, uh, central government funding that's still been coming in, like the um, business resurgence fund, the STAP funding. So we've we've still got those buffers in quarter one. They probably will be much less in quarter two. Um, we had a fair bit of uh, work to do with Doc when uh, the baby orca was stranded, um, looking at what we were going to do in terms of um, his euthanasia or what was going to happen there. So that was quite a lot of work for our vets. Um, we've got the Tourism Industry Awards happening, I think, in a couple of weeks. That was delayed because of COVID. So it's an online event now. So we're one of the three finalists for the um, environment category. So we're against, I think, Christchurch Airport. And I can't remember the other one. Um, Whitaker's Skink um, Work Conservation Breeding Program, we've been asked to actually be part of the conservation breeding program for that endangered skink. So this is really highlighting the work that we can do out of Tepiringa Iti, our new uh, reptile breeding facility. I feel a bit weird saying the next one, me being elected as vice president of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. It's, it was quite an honour to receive the vice presidency. There, there's never been a New Zealander 
who's been Vice President of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So that was quite an honour for me. Um, and really, I mean, when we think about the, the number of organisations that that covers across the globe, it's a huge, it's a huge honour to be that. We did an Ask Your Team survey um, for remote working and wellbeing during COVID lockdown. And we're just in the middle of doing our, our, um, our two year Ask Your Team survey around culture. So that closes next weekend. So that will be interesting to see what the themes are coming out of that. But in terms of the COVID work, they all felt pretty supported through COVID uh, working from home and their own wellbeing, which was really good to see. And then we were used as a case study for Gen Less Sustainability series of videos, which was also quite a good highlight for us to be involved with that project as well. So like everybody, lots going on, um, lots of good stuff. Um, COVID is always the challenge and working through where we sit in terms of vaccine mandates and what we're going to do in terms of that for the next period. Um, that's probably the thing that keeps me awake at night mostly but most things are good. So I'll hand back to Craig now to look at the forward picture. Thank you, Karen. Well, obviously front of mind is our Snow Leopard project. Uh, we're looking at, uh, while we continue fundraising, the project actual build begins on the 1st of December with the demolition of the uh, old bear uh, habitat and uh, building a real state-of-the-art uh, piece to um, allow the community to enjoy uh, connection with snow leopards. Planning for COVID-19, as Karen said, that's uh, front and centre as well. Uh, we're working through our risk assessment rate vaccinations and um, if events other from central government uh, don't uh, over, uh, overtake us, we're looking for a board consideration on the 17th of um, December. Our next uh, phase of uh, Kanohi Katia, which is our uh, cultural competency program is being rolled out that's um, includes uh, some board members as well as the staff so that's been um, very well led by um, and even in the um, uh, local iwi uh, which has been great or Taranaki Whanui. Uh, we celebrate the arrival of two male lions uh, from Copenhagen Zoo they should be uh, in the zoo on the 26th of this month um, in the habitat but will be a little while later than that before uh, you're able to see them as they get used to where they are and, and, and recover from their journey uh, from Copenhagen to Wellington. We're looking to build more office space. We have currently 118 uh, kaimahi at the zoo, so uh, we just need to make sure that they're in uh, appropriate and um, <clears throat> well-built office space. And we're also looking at the <coughs> excuse me, preparation for a male wing-tailed lemur to arrive for breeding, um, hopefully breeding by April next year. And the other point that isn't there is just our, because of the delays with Audit New Zealand, our actual audit uh, hasn't been finalised. We expect no problems. We expect it will be finalised. We're planning at March 22nd. As I say, we anticipate no issues around the audit. Uh, next slide gives our two male lions. Uh, this is what are um, about to come in transit and look forward to welcoming them to the zoo and obviously welcoming you as well. Thanks, happy to ask any questions. Itiaki kia ora. Um, thank you. We have Councillor Young, then Councillor Foon. Um, so thank you, thank thank you both. I've got a couple of questions, some smaller than others. First of all, what what is what classifies as a mini beast? Children? <laughs> <laughs> no, my well, tarantula is the first one that leaps to mind. But it, I'm it, sorry, it, what was that? It, tarantulas, uh, scorpions, but the, are they the, beasts? Millipede, the Hero HQ, which um, um, I'll be happy to take you through next time you visit. Um, um, Councillor Young, that'll be great. Thank you. I'll put that off for a while. Um, so, <laughs> so um, there was one measure that that you didn't meet. One um, Wellington Zoo Trust measure you didn't meet. Which one was that? Um, it was a. Uh, it was actually our um, the opex that we direct towards um, field conservation. 
So our target was 7% uh, of our OPEX and we only contributed 6.7%. Wow. Wow. So we, we were enough. pretty close. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the global benchmark for direct field conservation OPEX for zoos is about 3%. Oh, so okay. our aim has always been to get to where about 10% of our office. So we're on the way. Thank you. So then back to these male lions that Craig's obviously so excited about. Um, are they going to be used for a breeding program? So they're brothers. Um, I don't so they're coming from Copenhagen. They're but yeah, they're not going to be breeding with each other, no. 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 Um, so basically we've, we've, the brothers are coming and then... Um, we're thinking what obviously we think a long term out in terms of our species planning and we know that our cheetah are both very old animals now they're 12 and so once the cheetah go to the cheetah heaven then we will take that whole space that they're in and extend the lion area and then we can bring in females for breeding um okay thank you and then i think this is my last question oh yeah so the zoo is a charity right Yes. And so, so how does it work when you have charity partnerships? Does that mean that you're, as a charity, collecting for another charity, or how does that work? So, basically, it, 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 they are our conservation partners, and then in terms of the other charities we support in Wellington, uh, I guess what we used to get was a lot of charities writing to us for things like zoo passes and a whole range of things. And a couple of years back, we said, look, what, what are the charities we really want to support in the city? that have an alignment with us in terms of some of our purpose. So we obviously um, worked, have worked for a long time with Ronald McDonald House and with the Children's Foundation at the hospital. Um, and then we looked at, well, what were the other charities that really involve children and can make family access to the zoo a whole lot easier. So that really aligns with our purpose. So with City Mission, we work with them in terms of access and the same with change makers. So those, those charities are the ones that we would put our effort into. And so we, we can actually sort of really focus on how we support. Conservation partners, they're linked to our, the animals that we care for. And the majority of those um, partners are to do with endangered or critically endangered animals. The only one we have that isn't, it's a vulnerable animal, which is the sun bear but they're iconic animals for us, so we retain our relationship with Free the Bears. Okay, thank you, and thank you both, because you know my views on the zoo and how much you've changed them, so I think you do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Foon. Atina Kurua, Karen and Craig, thank you so much for the mahi you're doing for our city and the leadership that you are constantly uh, striding ahead with. Um, particularly great around the, um, yeah, being in the video for Jen Less around the sustainability aspects and the bicultural, the bicultural work, that's so exciting. Um, and while I really want to dig into the locusts breeding program, um, I'll say, I'll take that offline and come and visit. So, so just, I've got two strategic questions, really. I just want to um, just get it. Do you feel like you're getting um, like a consistency of systems and, and processes across the, the main council organisation through to, you know, you as a CCO? And then the next question um, is really around city strategy and understanding the, the city direction. And, and do you feel like as a CCO, you've got a clear link into that and reporting into that? Or do, or do you have any feedback? Wow. <laughs> um, I think um, in terms, I, you know, I think we're in a state of flux at the moment and I'm, and I'm conscious that, uh, that Warwick and Stephen are sitting at the table. And um, so when Claire was the coup, we had a lot of discussions amongst all the CCOs about how we would work together about thinking about how we add value to the city and being very much a part of the strategic direction of the city. So we'd had a lot of conversations with Claire. Then we went into a period where we were looking at the structure around economic wellbeing and the CCOs, which James led. And now we've moved to Stephen's area in terms of strategy. And I think that's a really good move because we can then start to look at strategically how do the CCOs add value. And we've obviously um, the economic wellbeing and CCOs manager 
will actually be a very critical role in bringing all of those things together. So while we're not just about economic well-being, we actually cover all the well-beings um, mm -hmm. to actually look at the CCOs as part of that strategic intent for the city and how do, how do we add value rather than it being just a reporting function, more of a, a conversation and a collaborative function of the city. I mean, you know, we, we, we're all very keen to be part of that. And, you know, the city does invest a lot in the CCOs. So we obviously want to be able to say, this is how we add value and actually deliver some of the strategies that are very important for you as the city leaders. So, you know, that's why th things like the, the carbon zero work and the Tiao Māori work that we've been doing mm. is really over the last few years, looking at our letters of expectation and our strategic framing in, in terms of the zoo strategy, how does that fit in terms of council, in terms of some of the concepts that need to happen within our strategy to support some of those areas. So I think, Laurie, if I look forward to that, I think there's going to be a real, um, a real opportunity for us to work with Stephen's team and to be able to really drive that real collaborative approach for the CCOs. Thanks, Karen. Good answer. Thank you. And um, Deputy Mifri? Yeah, I suppose um, the zoo is something we're all really proud of and it's come a long way in the 10 years or so or even a bit longer that you've had your capital program. But the Snow Leopards is the last one of those projects. So I guess the question would be is how do you see what, what comes next after the big investments to really upgrade the zoo? Um, where are we looking for the next few years out? Such a good question. Such a good question. So in the zoo world, um, we used to, I mean, I've been in the zoo world for about 30 years. So over that period of time, we used to think about zoo capital projects as lasting for a lifetime of about 25 years. Over that period of time, that's changed. So in terms of animal housing, it's probably about 10 years. So something like the nest decor hunger, much longer lifespan. But a chimp house, not quite so much because of the damage that they do and also the changes in animal welfare practice. So for example, last year, we had a big investment through our renewals project on the giraffe house because the way we manage giraffes in zoos has changed quite a bit over the last 10 years. So we're thinking all of that and think, and we've got to bring together a whole a number of threads when we think about this in terms of the strategy, is to think about what species do we do well at Wellington Zoo? Like we are not going to get elephants. We are not going to get rhino. You know, we just don't, we can't, we can't do those animals well in an, in an urban zoo like ours. But we can do big cats very well. We can do primates very well. So thinking about how we actually plan out our renewals going forward. And this is what we did last year with the LTP. We thought, well, let's not do massive big projects over the next 10 years, but we got a renewals uplift, which enables us to do smaller projects, but still be able to keep that momentum going about improving the visitor experience, the animal experience and our staff experience, our three customers. So really it's about thinking about the renewals in a different way and how do they actually work over the next 10 years. As we get 10 years out, I'll probably be sitting on a beach somewhere by then, Sarah. Um, but, you know, someone will have to go, well, where do we start now? Because things like the wild theatre will have outlived their life. Um, the chimp house will have outlived their life. So, but it's about planning that so that it's not a surprise. And it's about thinking about what we do in terms of animal welfare and staff welfare, particularly around dangerous animals, particularly. Yeah. So it's quite a complex process to work out where you're going to be strategically in 10 to 20 years. Well, sounds like you've already thought, done quite a lot of the thinking. <laughs> but thank you, Karen. That's a great <laughs> answer. I I'm appreciated that. Um, thank you. And, and a question from me is that, um, um, again, it's similar to what I asked the Basin Reserve, but it was is around the 
impacts of construction of the construction industry um, on on your um, even I'm assuming even maintenance aspects. Um, so how's that impacting the zoo? And did I see? I think I recall seeing something in our own council papers about a deferral of some funds for the snow leopards. Uh, well, we've we've had to delay the program because yeah. we should have started by now. Um, but we've, we'll be starting on the 1st of December, as Craig said, so we've had to delay the start. Mm. Um, but yes, it's definitely an issue in terms of maintenance, trying to get contractors is impossible. So, you know, when we need metal workers or we need fences or we need painters or electricians, they're so busy and it's like, you know, you've really got to wait. So for example, You'll love this story. We had we brought a spider monkey down from Hamilton Zoo, um, and he was let out onto the island with the females. He went straight across the water moat and up a tree. So it's like, uh, uh, that water moat's supposed to stop you. You're not supposed to go across. <laughs> it. But he tested that boundary, so we had to then drop the moat. We then had we got thousands of tons of sludge out of that moat. Now we have to build new electric fences in there. The animals have been in their house now for four months because we can't get the contractors to come in and do the work we need to do. Mm. So it's bordering on an animal welfare question for me. Mm. But this is an example of how it's been so difficult. So what's happening with the snow leopards is Naila Love um, have separated out demolition, for example, from the main construction contract so they can get moving with that. They're going to do some pre-ordering of things like the mesh because that will have to come in. So Naila Love, because they're in this, you know, right up to their neck, they know what some of the difficulties are. So that's been quite good having them on board for the Snow Leopard project. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's yeah, I mean, our, our director of um, safety, assets and sustainability, he tears his hair out, what little he's got left, <laughs> trying to get contractors on site. It's really hard. And I think it sounds like that also from a, a broader city perspective that, um, you know, in our own organisation, separate organisations, sometimes we may have to give away something for the greater good. Um, you know, well, we might have an animal welfare issue in the zoo um, as opposed to perhaps something that we might be doing as a, as a city council or even as another CCO. So I suppose it's, it is a timely reminder that we need to think um, very holistically on yeah. how we do use limited resources around. Yeah. So thank you. Th thanks for that. And that's a real life, you know, example. I think that, and, and it's worth it. And it's very appropriate because we, you know, we're looking at our whole capex program tomorrow at, at committee. Um, now I don't see any other hands up. So um, look, thank you, um, and thank you. Um, and for the great work that you're doing, and um, and also um, like all our CCOs, having to work in very uncertain times at the moment with with COVID, we are, we appreciate um, you know, and we appreciate that everybody's pretty tired as well, with you know constant trying to solve problems. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, we now have um, Zelandia. Um, welcome, Philip, and, and welcome, Danielle. Um, this is probably day three in your in your new role. Indeed, it is. It is. So thank you. Um, and nothing like facing the council on day three. <laughs> so, <A> pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs> okay. So look, um, 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 it, it, it was great to s s farewell Paul Atkins. Um, last week uh, on, in his last week and and the contribution that he's made so i just touch on that briefly but um, um yeah, it was good to recognize him but um i know from um from philip and paul that they're, they're very excited to see you in the role and so are we so so over to you thank you very much i wonder if i could start first and just say that we've had another successful year um, sound is a yes. bit um, it sounds, yeah, the sounds a bit, it's a bit distorted. Okay. Let's see if that works better. Yeah, that's better. 
Okay. We've, we've just uh, completed uh, another successful year with our sixth surplus in a row, and uh, we're very pleased about that. And our uh, general trading metrics that we use are all in good shape, and uh, we've started off the new year in good shape as well. So we're, we're pleased about that. Um, I know that you did ask a question earlier about uh, cost of construction, so I might just mention that we have a project on to build um, Tanglewood House, uh, and I know I've mentioned this before, we've addressed this before, and uh, we currently are in the position of uh, uh, just ascertaining that uh, the cost and timing of materials delivery will be, uh, uh, will be something we can deal with, and so we have a QS about to uh, tell us what he thinks those costs might be, um, but of course we haven't started the project yet, so we'll make sure we get all our ducks in a row in terms of cost and timing and everything before we, we start to move, but it's it's all in good shape. The team is in good shape and, um, and we're looking forward to another successful year, but of course over everything we have COVID, which is creating a lot of uncertainty and uh, as far as our budgeting and our business case goes, we've uh, completely um, done our business case without contemplating any visitors or income from anyone from offshore at all. So if, if, uh, if things do open up next year and we do see some people from overseas, then that'll be a bonus to our business case. But Danielle's got uh, a lot of uh, particular activity she'd like to share with you. So I wonder if I can pass to Danielle and uh, I don't know if we can to the activities there, Daniel. Can you all see that? Um, yep, we can see that. That's so great. If you could try and make it a little bit bigger because we can see your whole screen, but um, if you can't, oh, that's okay. Right, I'm just going to um, make sure I shared the correct screen. Is that better? Ah. Apologies, everyone. Sorry. Sorry, one moment. I'll get this technology sorted. Share. Hopefully. <laughs> Is that any better? Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Lovely. Um, right, so we have had an incredible year despite all the challenges that, of course, we're all facing at the moment. Um, I guess um, what I'm going to try and do now is tell you a bit of a story about some of the, the journeys we've been on. Um, but I guess to start with, Emihiana, Kinga Tohu o Nehe, o Te Whanganui Atara, e Noho Neo. So um, uh, just recognising this place where we are right now. Now that video that you can see on your screen, many of you will be familiar with that now. That is uh, an example of five tiny titi pranamu or riflemen fledging in the nest for the first time. These birds, New Zealand's tiniest bush bird, weigh about six paper clips each. And their survival is uh, just an example of incredible success. Now, what's most amazing about this, this video, it was taken by Melissa Boardman, an artist and Zealandia volunteer, is that this is not at Zealandia. This species was introduced 2019 to the sanctuary, and already we've seen them scale the fence and take off into the green spaces of Wellington. This nest was being filmed at Te Ahu Mairangi Hill. This is an example of Zealandia connecting people with nature and nature with the rest of our Wellington community. The, uh, this example really highlights how the community gets behind species like this when it happens. Zealandia has been able to work closely with the Wellington City Council, uh, with the community there to get predator trapping underway and running and this nest monitored as much as possible. A huge story of success. 
So Zelandia has a huge role and has continued to have a huge role over the last year in creating sustainable capital. And for us, that mission, of course, starts at home. So right here at Zelandia and the 225 hectares that we manage. Over the last year, some of our major projects in this area have had a focus on fresh water. This includes uh, restoring our wetland. Of course, wetlands have been hugely impacted uh, by habitat loss over the last 100 years, but also our lower reservoir system, which previously uh, was home to around 30,000 introduced perch. So a real major milestone project for us has been removing those perch, which involved uh, lowering that reservoir by about six meters and a whole range of other activities. But what that allows us to do in the future is focus on bringing back some of New Zealand's most threatened freshwater species. Species such as kapahi or freshwater mussels, they're in fact more endangered than any of our Kiwi species. So this um, marks a massive project coming to an end, but the start of a new era of reintroductions and freshwater focus for Zealandia. Of course, other major projects looking inside the fence, we have all our ongoing bird monitoring and so forth, but forest restoration continues to be a real priority for us. This last year, we managed to remove 90 of our pine trees. This is just the start of a long-term project that will involve restoring that, cape, that canopy of Zealandia to a full native forest cover. This is a, lot, this is a really long-term project. You can see these trees are absolutely enormous. And of course, as we go through this process, we really need to be making sure we don't affect other taonga like kiwi or tuatara that reside beneath. So at the moment, already in our first quarter, we are gearing up um, for that long-term planning process to make sure that the project is done really effectively and really well in the long term. Now, we are careful about how we pick the projects to, to put our effort into at Zealandia. And, and a big part of this is about finding our place in transformation, transforming how people live with na nature, but also how we do conservation in a way that reflects our responsibilities under Te Tiriti or Waitangi. Now, an incredible project that's an example of this is the reintroduction of Paul Tiranga. That's the very odd looking plant you can see down in the left hand corner of your screen there. This plant is effectively extinct from this area and we've been involved with Otari Wilton's bush but also the six iwi across this region to map out a new feature, uh, future for this species. All of New Zealand's eyes are on us in the conservation community for this work. Previously, translocations were done in a way where you put in a permit and you go and get that species and bring it back and maybe have a poor fitty at the time. This project is about creating meaning, about creating a collaborative working effort to get these projects under a way, as I say, in a way that reflects our responsibilities under Tiriti or Waitangi. There are a lot of people trying to solve this issue and so Zelandia is always looking to be at the forefront of this. For any project like this, we couple it with research as well. So this isn't just about doing the mahi. This is about learning from the process as we go so we can share it, others can learn from it, and others can implement it. Now, I guess over the last year, what we've seen is Wellingtonians uh, flocking to Zealandia, but also really supporting that mahi, that work that you've just um, seen a bit of a glimpse into. We managed to clock over 18,000 members in 2020, 2021, and that wasn't part of course um, because of the support received from the council at the beginning of the financial year when we were able to welcome Wellingtonians for free to Zealandia. This was a, a, a bit of an effort to, to capture those people and, and make them supporters in the long term. Most of these members are Wellingtonians, around 90 to 95%. Of course, we haven't been immune to the effects of COVID and that is becoming more and more apparent, of course, as we move into this, this quarter and into the next quarter. But for our last financial year, we did welcome 100, over 120,000 visitors to the sanctuary. So it's slightly down on the last year, but it's actually much ahead from where we expected to land. By and large, this again reflects Wellingtonians coming to Zealandia to reflect, to restore, and to find um, some restoration in the valley. 
Now, Bangladesh Pania is, of course, our um, education and outreach efforts as well. So over 12,000 education encounters um, occurred through the sanctuary last year. And this is starting to, to clock to land your app as being one of the, the um, primary op, you know, offers of environmental education, not just in Wellington, but across New Zealand as well. So the net result, of course, is our economic contribution to Wellington continues to be really substantial. And the estimate over the last five years is over $130 million to the economic value in Wellington. This is also our sixth year of a net surplus, which is an incredible achievement for Paul and the team um, from the past and something um, that sets us up incredibly well as we look to the next stages of how COVID affects how we operate. So just to um, to finish up, really, um, we we I guess Zelandia really is a place that is about connecting people with nature. It's about connecting organisations. We never work alone. A really good example of this is our Sanctuary to Sea project. The project Te um, Modi or Te Kaiwhara. We're working to restore the Modi or the life force of the Kaiwhara catchment. This project brings many organisations together and we were lucky enough in the last um, uh, financial year to secure a centre port as a major strategic partner to that in addition to those you see on the screen there. An example of a project that's happening through that that really aligns well with the council's objectives and with um, our objectives as well is of course every business restoring nature. This is a collaboration between the Department of Conservation, centre port and Zelandia and of course the council, as I say, have been involved along the way. This kind of work can mobilise the 130 businesses that are in that kaiwharawhara catchment to take action on the land that they're sitting on, but also to become involved in the community. Again, this is a project that research is attached to. It has significant interest from New Zealand's National Science Challenge. There are very few examples of where people are mobilising for action in urban catchments, catchments with over 10,000 houses present that really create significant challenges for restoring fresh water. So just to wrap up, um, Zelandia is about creating an inclusive, sustainable and creative capital. And I think that's really clear from our annual report. I hope you'll have a copy and have it on your coffee tables. It actually is quite a beautiful document with amazing photographs as well. We take an integrated reporting approach um, and, you know, have achieved uh, quite a remarkable amount under Paul's leadership. Uh, thank you, Danielle. Um, now, I'm not, don't see any questions. Um, do we have any questions? No. Um, look, I think it's, um, um, sorry, Councillor Foon. Um, thanks, Danielle and Phil. Good to see you. Um, and I, I am really um, excited and fascinated about the Sanctuary to Sea project. So I just want to know if there's anything more that, that we at Council could be doing to, to support or be part of that. Well, yes, absolutely. So Council is very much a, a strategic partner on that project. We have a strategic leadership group. So we have um, um, count, um, council officers, on, so I guess um, staff sitting on that, that strategy group. We are always excited and eager to involve council in more ways. So if there are departments that you would like to see um, more part of that mahi, we'd be very welcome to that. Um, yeah. yeah, I just wonder with the business crossover if there's, you know, like what, what um, maybe I'll take it offline, but it's just Great work, but yeah, I'd like to understand just with that collaborative approach, what more we could be supporting with. Um, yeah, absolutely. And there, there's an opportunity coming up now. I've just received in this first quarter, I've just received confirmation of funding support to support a role that will actually drive that project further and faster. And so collaborating and, and making sure we've got that cross organisation connection be front and centre of that position. That's awesome. Great. Congratulations. Be a um, good, good story for Wellington. Um, Councillor Foon, this um, program is also, I think, Daniel, has been going for about four years, hasn't it? 
Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So it's been, and I understand the mayor was part of it. I don't know whether he still goes along to the meetings, but it had quite a good cross section of community involved. So it's been on our books for a, a wee while. But like these things, good things take time. So, um, yes. Look, I think you've been really clear. And I know a few of us came up and, and visited you last week as well. Um, um, to when we farewell Paul, um, but it was also just good to sort of discuss what was happening there at um, at Zelandia. And I know many of us are actually frequent visitors there anyway, so um, don't take the lack of questions as um, uh, as not of any interest. It's just that we're probably very familiar um, um, with the location and, and what you have to offer. Um, so look, um, thank you very much, and um, keep up the great work, and um, and we'll look forward to sort of chatting with you in a bit more detail, Danielle. Um, we'll, we'll let you get your feet under the desk and get yourself sorted <laughs> for a bit, yeah. Um, okay, um, colleagues, we are now going to take a 10-minute um, a break. It's 25 past um, 2, um, and you'll be pleased to know we are we are on schedule. In fact, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So, um, so we're 10 minutes, so I say we'll come back at um, 2.35. Thank you.
resume. Um, thank you, for um, Ms. Wrightson, for pointing out that my back was to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really difficult when the Zoom camera is on one end of the table, so I'm moving to the side so I can turn, to, you know, without having to um, um, do a 180 degree turn all the time. So, um, welcome, welcome Jane, welcome Sarah, and um, we are now going um, into um, hearing about from Experience Wellington um, with your brief presentation and, um, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Thank you. Now, Mehi Mahana Ote Waki Tato, called Jane Wrights and Topo I'm pleased and proud to have led Experience Wellington uh, alongside our trustees, our Chief Executive Sarah Rushon and our leadership team over a challenging year. Um, as you know, we're in a, a period of change, both initiated by us and also experienced by us as we grapple with the complexities of um, COVID. Um, I do echo Wellington New Zealand's uh, comments about the resilience of our city and our people, which we are seeing as well. And I'm aware of the uh, CCO chief executives working closely together to harness um, collective influence and resources, which is just terrific and exactly, of course, what we need to do. Um, Sarah will take you through the top line results of our annual port in, in quarter one, but I'd like to highlight three quickly three key points at a higher level for Experience Wellington around revenue, um, around experiences and about collaboration. So firstly, revenue, we are so grateful for the council support for our work in bringing marvellous experiences to Wellington from magnificent contemporary art to telling Wellington stories, to providing creative learning opportunities for our tamariki. In a tough economic environment, it's important that Experience Wellington is well equipped to maximise third party revenue. This will be a fierce focus of our trust board in the coming year, so the appointment of trustees and leaders with the right skills is important because we don't underestimate the challenge in this economic environment. I'm delighted to highlight that in the last year, we added 3.74 million to the 10.5 million Wellington City Council revenue. That's nearly 36% leveraging, um, and we want to increase that effort. The success and growth of our small team with a very big job depends on stable council support and our own efforts to leverage revenue. Um, secondly, experiences. We've delivered several hundred hours of vastly different cultural and scientific experiences to Wellington and its visitors. Um, and of course, I have to point out, because all of us do all the time at the moment, that the upcoming opening of the magnificent Hilmara Clint exhibition is a tribute to our clever City Gallery team and the wider experience Wellington team and their collective work uh, of bringing these masterpieces to our very lucky city. Uh, the stories of getting um, a priceless set of paintings to a small city at the bottom end of the world in the middle of a global pandemic uh, are enough of a book in its own right. Uh, and thirdly, collaboration that the councils and your family of uh, CCOs together have the privilege of helping and serving our city. Our collective impact is considerable and it's great uh, to see meetings like this looking at strategy and results. Um, we have some meaty opportunities and challenges ahead and Experience Wellington is particularly delighted to be actively involved in both the Tomas Pihi project and the Narco Civic Square projects. Uh, again, uh, we are stronger together than we are alone, as we all know. So thank you again for your collective and individual for support for Experience Wellington. Uh, I'll now pass over to our Chief Executive, Sarah Russian to talk through our results in more detail. Dena goto, dena goto, dena goto kato. Kia ora tato, uh, ko Sarah Shamaho. I'm the Chief Executive of Experience Wellington. Thank you, Jane. And um, I just want to echo Jane's sentiments as well, that the, the support of Wellington City Council across this year has been um, well something that we have really valued and um, 
the support on so many levels in so many ways has, has made an enormous difference for us and for the ways in which we can continue our mahi and continue to connect with hundreds of thousands of people across Wellington and beyond. So um, I just want to quickly touch on the annual report. Um, we've had a year, as Jane has said, hundreds of hours of programs set against a backdrop of extraordinary challenging circumstances. Uh, this image from the front cover of our annual report uh, is from the show Seasons, which in spite of COVID toured nationally. And the work of the National Theatre for Children based at Capital E engaged over a hundred Wellington creatives and provided hundreds of hours of work for that ecosystem across a time when there was very little going on. And I think our perseverance and the fact that this tour um, got up and running, we were able to put two of the tours into production as well and provide that stability for um, a, a sector that was severely affected is something that we're really, really proud of. That leverage doesn't happen in isolation, and Jane has already touched on that. Um, we have been putting a lot of work in over the last year and a half on the way that we con uh, we reach our visitors and looking at our visitors, not just people who are coming to us physically, but people who are contacting us online. And we are seeing really strong growth in our social media and our website visitors, our learning experiences not just the number of um, children who come through our doors, but the number of hours they spend with us are also really, really um, strong and in some cases growing at a, at a time when we did not think that that might uh, be possible. The importance of our online presence is huge at the moment, um, at a time when um, we would dearly love to hold those big joyous events we know we can't. And so our teams work really hard where they can, holding smaller, more intimate um, connecting events or moving things online or in some cases doing both. And we've had some fantastic online experiences throughout this whole, um, throughout this whole, uh, this whole period that um, not just speak to Wellington and Wellingtonians, but have brought in audiences from across Aotearoa and even internationally as well. So it's a, it's a space where COVID provides us with an opportunity and we will be exploring that and embracing that into the future. Uh, we've um, welcomed over 400,000 visitors this year. That's more than we anticipated. And our online presence, as I said, has grown across this period too. We have done so many different things in this last year, from the mittens exhibition to um, baking and breaking bread uh, to um, remember Paddy Hacker at Nairn Street Cottage. We are really focusing on our sustainable capabilities. So embracing Te Māori, working together as one team, Mahitahi, and focusing on experience rather than Wellington flourishes. So looking at ways we can bring in not just the bottom line, but our sustainable future into every decision we make. We've done huge projects um, with the Wananga and Tikanga Māori folded in, um, working with Pacifica experts on the Natohonga Pakatere project, the navigators, and um, I'll be talking a bit more about that later. Looking at our carbon emissions, the way we've upgraded lighting and HVAC supported by New Zealand lotteries. Uh, in spite of COVID, our uh, venue hire business, when we were able to open, went off like a rocket. And we were seeing um, businesses from across the region coming and using those fantastic, unique places within the museum, within the gallery, within Space Place to hold their events. And we were delighted to welcome them. And, building our Māori capability internally as well. So we've been able to launch Te Reo Māori education programmes um, at a number of our sites during this year. And as Jane mentioned, we normally, we set ourselves a target of um, raising a third of our overhead ourselves through admissions, through retail, through venue hire, through fundraising. And um, in the last financial year, we were delighted to see that figure reaching 36% and that is a goal that we will continue to set ourselves and strive toward. So looking at Q1, um, the spectre of COVID unfortunately looms large over this quarter. Um, we've had extraordinary shows, events, I cannot tell you 
um, the pain that goes along uh, for our team with producing and setting up uh, our exhibitions and events and then having to unproduce them or putting on amazing shows and just having to close the doors. Um, and you'll see that reflected in, in these numbers. Um, and in spite of the fact that we had that protracted close down, um, we are, we, we were ahead of the game when those close and when those close ends happened and you know we are really really excited by the um to hear more clarity about the traffic light framework and how we can launch really really quickly and in a way that is comprehensive when those come into force some of those q and highlights um home is where the art is a creative installation at capital e that was done in collaboration with a range of local artists and um trying to work around covid restrictions in a high touch space like play hq which is for zero to five year olds not just high touch but lots of other um uh, unmentionables uh, flying around in that space so providing that space for our youngest citizens, for families that may not necessarily have access to space to play in their own homes um, is something that's really important. So navigating those restrictions and being able to provide those beautiful experiences is again, really important to us. Um, at Wellington Museum, a Keith Quinn display and talks have been unveiled. Um, we also, thanks to a tip off from Council Fitzsimons, uh, Kenny the Poets um, broken up PA Machine uh, has also joined our collection. We had four extraordinary shows at City Gallery. Uh, Brett Graham, Ty Moana, Ty Tangata, um, Judy Miller, Tiara Ronganui, and Pierre Heeg, which were just wonderful, wonderful shows. But unfortunately, we had to close the doors on and move some of the programming as much as we could online. Um, and of course, Throughout that period, we had Matariki, we were able to provide um, participating councils events and hold a range of exciting um, uh, events and programs that really spoke to our place in that uh, ecosystem across the city. This is a project that has been two years in the making. It's uh, funded by uh, Ministry of Culture and Heritage, alongside support from Wellington City Council and from other funders who've come alongside. Um, a whole series of wananga and work has gone into ensuring that this show is probably the most comprehensive um, look at Māori and Pacifica navigation, putting it in the context with Western astronomy and Western navigation techniques, but really telling that Pacific specific story. It is a work that was done absolutely in collaboration with Wellington Creatives, Island Productions, um, Dusk as well, doing the, um, the 360 production. So really tapping into those creative industries that we have around the city and making sure that we are where we could connecting in and making sure that money flowed through us through that leverage out into those communities again during um, a really uh, hard time. This show is fantastic. I'm really hoping that we can set up a time for councillors to come up and see it. Um, we would love to share it with you. It has been booked out since it opened. It opened uh, for the school holidays and you, we can't, you know, you can't squeeze people into it. It is really great. And the, um, the feedback we've had and being able to share it with a creative team, we we're hoping to have a, a wonderful launch for it, but unfortunately COVID got in the way, but being able to bring the master navigators, our Tikanga experts, um, the people who worked on that show together with our team to celebrate its launch was a really, really moving and special occasion. And we're looking forward to sharing it with you soon. Another project that is um, hugely important, not just in the short term, but in the long, long term, not just for Experience Wellington, but for Wellington and Wellingtonians is Tamatapihi and um, bringing capital E back to Tanako Civic Square integrated within the Tamatapihi framework. Um, this is something that our team are hugely excited by. Um, it has been wonderful to work in close collaboration with Gisela, Lucy, Lorinda, Paul, and the rest of the Tamatapihi team. And beyond that, looking at how our teams from Experience Wellington, our teams from the library can use Tamatapihi as a beacon for storytelling, story making, celebrating what makes us Wellingtonian, how that connects to the stories of Aotearoa, and 
really contributing and handing the baton on to our youngest citizens to take that creativity and to tell their stories and to amplify their voices. Um, story making, you know, from VR to making zines to writing old school, absolutely, it is all nourishing, it's all important, and we're delighted to be part of this experience. And of course, as Jane mentioned, Hilma Afklint, uh, I have word that the first cases have been opened today. Um, the, the big blue boxes full of those extraordinary artworks are on the floor. We are starting to hang the work. We are building walls. Um, invitations have gone out to the opening night and um, we are just um, fingers crossed that we're going to be able to do this exhibition justice in terms of working within the COVID framework to get as many people through the show as possible. 600,000 people saw the show and it's at the Guggenheim. Um, our uh, targets are a wee bit more modest than that. Uh, we are banking on that sort of Wellington region engagement and a, a bit of domestic engagement beyond that. But we think this show is going to be a blockbuster. The partners who are working with us, um, not just Council, but the City Gallery Foundation, um, the New Zealand Arts Festival. Um, I want to give a hat tip to Liz at um, Cricket Wellington as well, who, you know, being able to create synergies between a show like this and that extraordinary celebration of um, the uh, female sports people who are beginning coming through um, as we celebrate the Cricket World Cup in New Year. There are just so many opportunities to leverage off this for Wellington. Um, Koto, Glueware, QT Wellington have come on board as partners. And we are, at the moment, we're sitting on 3,000 tickets have sold. And we are getting lots and lots of inquiries and interest. You'll start to see the programming um, coming through uh, for the events we're going to wrap around this. And you should be starting to see billboards uh, going up around the city and starting to create that, that big, big buzz. I know my social media is full of this show um, and yeah, there's lots of excitement. So in terms of planning for 22, 23, um, we've been uh, working closely with the council team on uh, looking at the Wellington Museum Strengthening Project. Um, we are hugely grateful for that 21 million that uh, came through in the LTP process to contribute to that. And it has been great to see the, um, the geotechnical investigations happening along the waterfront, because that for us is going to contribute to how we frame up the engineering solutions we look at for that project. Returning capital E to Tanako Civic Square, and indeed supporting the redevelopment of Tanako Civic Square. That is huge for Tamatapihi, huge for capital E, huge for City Gallery as well. That is you know, Tanako is the heart and creating that hub for arts and culture, being able to connect that part of the city through to, to Fodiwaka, to Papa and beyond and the waterfront. What an exciting project that's going to be. Um, and we really, really want to be um, part of the, the corridor that sits around that piece of work. We are working hard on our waste minimization plans and we expect to see that um, writ large in our SOI. And as Jane said, Strict cost, strict cost control, robust financial management, and exploiting as much as we can those opportunities for revenue generation, sitting in those commercial spaces, but also from a fundraising perspective as well. We're looking forward to working with council's property team to look at better ways of maintaining our sites. And always, always, we're looking at enhancing our experiences and looking at ways of attracting, engaging local businesses, but also supporting the ecosystem, the creative ecosystem, the arts, culture and heritage ecosystem that sits within the city as well, and developing ourselves as a leader in that space. So kia ora tato. Um, that's it from me. Any questions? Um, thanks, Sarah and Jane, and um, being fortunate enough to see the navigators, and I know we are looking forward to getting a session arranged for um, elected members because it really is... Desperate. Um, it, sorry? Desperate. Yes, I know. Um, but the, the, you need to be treated special. So, um, um, look, uh, it is definitely well worth it, and I think it's a great testament to, um, um, to experience Wellington and be able to... Um, 
collaborate um, and source funding from elsewhere because it wouldn't have been made otherwise um, to the level that it has been. So um, great work. Um, and I know we're all looking forward to seeing Hilma Afklint. And um, I think we could even get a poster up here, put it up in the council chambers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, a bit of art. Um, um, now I'm just looking, I can't see the screen. Have we got any, anybody with their hands up? Oh, sorry, well, we'll go to Councillor Young. We definitely, your microphone's not on. Yeah, we definitely do want to do that, and we've got someone trying to find a date. Thank you very much for the invitation, Sarah. Yeah. I just, when, when Sarah said they couldn't squeeze any more people in, my heart sank two inches. Um, so the other thing is, what happens after Hilma? Because we've got the planning for next year, but there was no mention of, of the programming for the City Gallery. Uh, Kia ora, Councillor Young. So the next show coming in after Hilma is called Matero. It is um, uh, a show focusing on Māori artists and it is co-curated uh, with Shannon Ta'au. And after that? After that, we're still working on some options around that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't think any other questions. Um, I wonder whether... Um, um, Sarah, that you could just touch briefly on, you have your, um, you, you've been through the um, internal restructuring and just, um, um, and really just, if you could just inform us on how that's settling down. Yep, so um, that was finalized in June. So uh, our new groups and uh, ELT members are in place. We've done a lot of, um, work with that group to look at the collective responsibility, look at the ways that we work together across the organization. And um, it's been fantastic to see, for example, Hilma, we have staff working on that project from across the organization. And to see people coming together around projects, sharing their expertise, staff getting to know each other and getting to understand the skills and experiences that they have that um, previously they weren't actually aware of and to start it to see those groups of expertise growing and starting to flourish. So part of that project as well has been um, looking at how we boost uh, our skills in-house around engaging with our Māori. So we've been working um, with our trustee, Peter Jackson in particular, but also with people like Kuripa and um, other external people to look at how we build that internally and how we work to ensure that um, recruits for that role, our Te Tohono Reo role, which is that really key Māori leadership role, um, work well for us and align with the work that council is doing. And we're absolutely delighted to see that um, uh, workshops for CCOs coming up with Kalipa in, I think it's December that we're going to be getting together to discuss that. I think it gives us an opportunity to look at those broad council strategies and how we fit into them um, from a, a group, from a, a one team perspective. So things like Ahutini and Atakura, being able to apply those principles rather than being sort of focused on by one team, they're now being looked at from an organizational standpoint. And I think that's something that um, we'll be able to take example, uh, um, really take forward quite strongly. And also looking at those whole of organ, things which affect the whole of organization like um, our challenges with COVID-19. Um, discussions we had just this morning around the ELT table, all around the, um, the way that operationally and strategically we rise to meet that challenge. Um, it's been really great to see that ELT team coming together from a leadership perspective and all uh, participating really, really strongly in the challenges that await us from uh, a COVID vaccination certificate perspective and how we operationalize that, not just in um, across sites, some of which are paid for, some of which are free and a show like Hilma as well. And I'd, and I'd just like to support that from a board point of view. It's been um, absolutely noticeable, the improvement in uh, cross-team collaboration and cross-team thinking 
as we grapple with higher level strategic matters than um, you know the a range of very small operational detail that was bogging down everybody. One other question I've got is um, obviously COVID has um, is, is is here to stay, and, and how we respond is changing depending on where things are at. How uh, um, how is the organisation able to um, deal with that? I mean, because obviously, I think everyone's feeling that um, things change so quickly, and also we, we, we don't have processes in place. I think New Zealand doesn't have processes in place, let alone council or the organisation. So, um, th this how how are you responding, and how much energy? capacity is this taking up of the organization to actually uh, deal with this? Thank you, Councillor Carver. It's, it, is, it takes a huge amount of bandwidth, not just the opera, uh, operationalization and the pragmatic parts of dealing with, with COVID and the guidelines and the legal points of, uh, perspectives, but also dealing with the, the emotional weight, as I said, for my programmers, my educators, people working in the exhibition space, who put so much time and thought and passion into the shows, the programs, the events, and then having to change them up, having to cancel them, having to think about them in a different way. That means that, you know, we've lived several lives, I think, across the last few years as we've made that journey together. And I'm not, that's not just applies to my sector, I know it applies to my colleagues in council, I know it applies to so many other sectors as well. Um, from uh, that pragmatic um, operationalization perspective, I want to lean into something uh, Karen said and a question from Councillor Foon, that the um, this is a time when our relationships with my fellow CCOCs, my relationship with my peers at council are hugely important. We want to present a cohesive, coherent approach to Wellington and access to all of our amazing experiences, our libraries, our pools, our rec centres, as well as, um, you know, zoos, energy, as much as possible. We want to make it easy for Wellingtonians in a, you know, an uncertain time to access the extraordinary events and experiences that we have in front of us. And so for, for me, the, the support and having corridor sharing resources, sharing thinking between um, this group, um, my fellow chief execs, people you know in other parts of the sector, so working with people like Meg at the festival, Courtney over at Tabapa, but really thinking about how we can make a hard job easier for us by connecting, by collaborating, by taking the resources and not reinventing the wheels 17 different ways in 17 different places. And, you know, I really want us to embrace that. COVID is one example of that, but that's a model that can also be reflected in our approach to embracing Te Māori. It can be embraced in our approach to so many things. And that's why, you know, these relationships are so important. And this kind of sense of work, walk, walking shoulder to shoulder with each other is absolutely huge. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, is there any other questions? I can't see any. Well, I think you've been um, very clear. And um, oh, sorry, Councillor Foon. Sorry, um, Sarah. Thank you. And I know that you know, especially at the moment, it's um, you know, it, it, there's a little bit of doing it as we go. But the statement you've just made is is you know really great, and we've been trying to um, enable that. Or we want to see that enabled just even from that supported feeling supported space um but do you i think the question i have is do you feel like we're actually doing that or do you think we're trying to do it and we've got a way to go i think some of uh, some of that happens naturally laurie we have got some strong relationships around this table and around with, with my with my council colleagues we naturally lean into that um i think that um there are examples from other councils in New Zealand who have been quite, uh, maybe it's, um, you know, the advice has been quite clear around the way that council's intending to, to go, but I understand this is a hugely complex um, area. And, you know, I think as, as you alluded there, we are kind of building the aircraft as we're flying it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, right. so, and I appreciate that, you know, I might think that my business is complicated, 
um, but that is nothing compared to the machinations of council and, and how that all fits together. So that kind of keeping talking, that absolute recognition that collaboration is key and how we can support each other to make sure we've got that clarity and that coherence is, is super important. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for all your mahi. Um, thank you, and um, um, and, um, and another good presentation. So thank you, and I think you've been um, very clear. And um, like all our CCOs, is um, uh, you're critical to Wellington, um, and um, and we really have to do be working together in these times, which um, we were talking offline before of having to continually pivot. Um, and just so, and we know that takes up a lot of energy and resources. And what we set out to do three months ago, sometimes because no, we, we won't get there. So um, look, thank you. And um, um, and you've, you've got the rest of the afternoon off. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so next um, we have, is it Sky Stadium? Okay, well, should we go to the cable car? Warwick, should we? Okay, we'll go to the cable car, um, since Caesar's um, probably dying to have a say anyway. Um. <laughs> I'll take that with the uh, the love that it was in, intended it was right there. It was absolutely full of love, because I know you're such an enthusiastic person, so, um, and <laughs> passionate about your business. So thank you. So. Over to you, Caesar. Have you got Andy Matthews with you or just you? Uh, it's just me at the moment. Okay. Andy was due to arrive in about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so if you could hold all the questions to when he arrives and then <laughs> we'll go rapid fire on him. Okay. That will teach. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, you go ahead. <laughs> um, okay. Let me just navigate through and just let me know when you can see our, our time walk through the tunnels. Yes, we can see that. Perfect, thank you. Um, thanks for, for hosting this afternoon. And, and I think I've been listening for the last couple of hours and I'll just echo what everyone has said. It is an incredibly difficult time, but made a lot easier by the support of our colleagues. Um, and it's it's been a journey the last year. And I'm going to just start with a brief couple of points on our annual report um, and what we've what we've achieved. Um, just touch base a little bit on our shared purpose and values, which we had the bandwidth to develop as we try to find a new direction for the cable car. Um, I'll touch base on the passenger numbers and a little bit of the financials at the end of FY21. Um, pay a little focus to one of our value or a couple of our values, Kaiti Akitanga in our guest centered and then some examples of how the cable car is reimagining itself and will continue to do that through the coming years. <clears throat> now, our audit was only completed about 36 hours ago. That's when I finally received um, our audit opinion. I, so what was included was uh, an early draft. Um, it was a little bit delayed like um, some of the other CCOs have experienced, but it is, um, it is up on our website and, and Warwick does have a copy as of about 15 minutes ago. COVID really was an opportunity for us to relook at our business and what we are, what we aspire to be and how we can align and support council. Um, our shared purpose was developed through a collaborative approach from everyone from our new directors all the way through to um, our youngest frontline staff members. Um, we are very much focusing on hosting great Wellington experiences that locals are proud of and visitors talk about. Um, we did spend quite a bit of time on the nuance of that and it is very deliberate, deliberate talking about what the cable car, the asset that it is to the local community. Um, we take our role, and we'll talk about this in, in just a second, as kaitiakis of this Wellington Tonga. And we, we feel very, very strongly that we are here 
but for a moment in time with the cable car, we are all very focused on making sure that it's here for another generation um, so that the next group can also enjoy it. FY 2021 was very difficult as you guys um, have all alluded to. So I just wanted to share this. Um, the dark green line on the top was what our last normal year would have looked like where we were nudging 1.2 million visitors. The dark, uh, the line below it, you can see the effects of COVID as, as February starts to flatline. The brown <clears throat> dash line was our forecast. Now we would, this was um, uh, much like Danielle, my, my first, my third day on the job, I met with all of the councillors via Zoom. And then about two weeks later, I had to produce a, a re-forecast for visitors. We, we did our best. It was very, very conservative. And I'm really happy to say that throughout the year, we exceeded visitation um, by about 50,000 passengers. So that was a really uh, great and positive outcome. With... Um, with revenue, we had also exceeded revenue um, by about $75,000. Um, however, it was a significantly difficult time and we posted a, a, a large operating deficit, which thanks to council support, we managed to, and the grants that we received, we managed to reduce that to an operating deficit of just over $120,000. So, for an incredibly challenge year, challenging year um, from a financial point of view, um, thanks to the support of council, uh, it wasn't too bad. We continued to use a lot of our savings and divert that from asset replacement and renewal to just carrying on operating um, losses through the year. We, like I said before, our, our roles as Kaitiak is, is, is very important to us. Um, we undertook our most ambitious annual maintenance shutdown that we have ever done. So what you can see there is um, a picture of the two bogies being changed over. Normally it takes about six to seven months to refurbish one of those bogies. And during our man annual maintenance shutdown last year, the team did it in 11 days. It was a Herculean effort to be able to um, really turn that around. Um, we finished uh, half a day ahead of time under, um, with no accidents or incidents throughout the program. So it was um, really a tremendous effort for the team. And that just sets our focus to ensure that we're taking this time to make sure that when tourism does return, we're really ready to capitalize. All our assets are looking good. Our processes are great. We've um, got everything dialed to be able to uh, hit the ground running as soon as the borders open and whatever comes through the door. As I'll talk about in the second part of this presentation, our focus this year and into the future, into the short-term future, really looks at the seismic resilience of our tunnels. We also spend quite a bit of time looking at our guest experience and how we can use the cable car in a different way, how we can support, um, how we can support the community and events in, in different ways. And um, we have started to theme the cable car, introducing different aspects to the journey. We've held performances. We've been featured, um, as you can see up there, with 660 on, um, their road to, to the capital. <clears throat> and we're really looking forward to doing more um, in the future. We got bumped by um, Sky Stadium. We did. That's right. Um, so um, we're, we're really looking at how we can uh, explore different options. We've um, not quite confirmed, but we're looking forward to hosting our first wedding here at the cable car in the next few weeks. Now, moving to, to Q1 of this financial year, um, I was just gonna once again touch around our financial passenger numbers, talk about our role as providing um, 
an, an asset to the community and how we engage with the local Tamariki coming out of the latest lockdown. Um, I don't have a baby chimpanzee and I can't leverage that like the zoo can, but we've got lots of dogs and the amazing reaction <laughs> that the community has provided um, in respect to that trial. And some of our efforts around waste minimization and sustainability, and I'll finish off with a very quick piece on the CapEx and what we've done and what we're looking to do through the next 12 months. <clears throat> So very similar graph to one that you just saw a couple of slides ago, um, but what is overlaid is the dashed blue line was our forecast visitation for this year. And the solid blue line um, just coming in at the bottom is, is what we have uh, thus far. And this does include October. Important to note that in Q1, we lost a month of operational, uh, three weeks unplanned due to COVID in one week, um, for our annual maintenance shutdown this year. We had very, very um, conservative expectations on visitation and um, we continue to prepare for um, pretty much a domestic um, visitation profile through to the end of the year. The lockdown also gave us an opportunity to refocus uh, in getting some planning going, especially for internal development. Um, and the team in the space of about three days when we knew where we were coming out, um, really focused on delivering a really good, feel good message to the community as soon as coming out and giving people a reason to get out of their houses, come out and explore. So we launched Kids Ride Free in September. It ran for just over two weeks. We had huge um, pickup from the community, including Paddy Gower there doing his best to, um, to get Wellington's experience voted in at one of their Whip Around Friday events. Um, uh, I think he could have done a better job and pushed a little harder, but we came in a close second. But through that promo, 400 local Tamariki got to ride the cable car for free and they brought on their far now and, and enjoyed something that they perhaps wouldn't have necessarily experienced or even brought coming to the city. Um, so we were really stoked with the uptake on that. Now, the Kelvin precinct is, is a critical point for both our, our visitors, but also our, our local Wellingtonians. And it is the access, the cable car is the access to one of the most amazing green spaces of any city that I've lived, ever lived in. And with more people moving and living in the CBD, we really see the cable car as a, a key connector for them to be able to enjoy some green space, whether it's on the daily basis or on the weekend. Um, we have had amazing support. Over 85 dogs have traveled in the first two weeks. I'm really happy to report that there have been no accidents or incidents uh, with the dogs. So, and we have a really special treat from, for when we get to 101 um, dogs as, as there's a Dalmatian ready to come out and do the social media rounds um, at that point. So it is something that we're looking, we will review next week and we hope that uh, as it's going, we'll keep it as a permanent fixture. Um, and um, really just incentivize uh, the locals and, and being very targeted towards our, our local communities to be able to use this incredible asset. We do have a very modest footprint, but doesn't mean that we can't continually try to do better. Um, so in the last uh, few months, with, together with our new cleaning providers, we've been tracking but sorry, we've installed these recycling stations. Uh, at the moment, it's in our, in our offices, uh, so for our back of house stuff. Um, and I'm really happy to report that in our first month tracking, we are diverting 20% of our waste away from landfill into commingled recycling. Um, so our aim is to track this for another few months, set a benchmark and some targets, and then um, also move this into the customer facing side of the business and continue to see how much we can reduce our overall waste, but also 
how how much we can continue to divert from landfill. And finally, um, it's not as sexy as dogs, but far uh, equally as important, it is our seismic resilient project that we continue to push ahead with. Here you can see a picture of our um, middle tunnel. This is the upper portal of the middle tunnel. And you'll see that we often reference the north wall there on the left, the portal itself, and up the top, there's a little parapet. Um, so we've um, been working with WSP and they've provided some engineering estimates. Um, and at the moment, we lost approximately 50% of the funding because of um, NZTA uh, just allocated it elsewhere. So our approach has been, let's focus on what we can do with the 50% that remains through LTP and um, focus on continuing to move these projects forward. The, currently, the engineering estimates allow us to complete the north wall, the portal and the parapet that you see here, um, which are our higher priority items. And we'll continue to work and try to source funding from elsewhere to continue to work on the other items. Once again, it is this time. There's a great opportunity. There's a great opportunity here for us to continue to be Hello. prepared. Yes, you're Hello. Jane. Hello. Oh. Jane Wrightson's just not on mute and taking a phone call. Okay. There we go. Mm. So just to wrap it up, it's a great opportunity for us to make sure that we carry out this work whilst it won't impact a huge number of, of visitors. Um, we're intending for it to intersect through our next year's annual maintenance shutdown, um, which will have minimum impact to anyone using the cable car, but there will be some scaffolds set up there so the teams can work for about anywhere between six and eight weeks. Um, like it was brought up before by Karen, um, by, by Sarah, getting trades, getting people committed to projects um, is an art form and quite difficult at this time, but we're working with some amazing partners who are, are committed to the success of the tunnel strengthening pro programs. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you, Caesar. and I noticed you've been joined by um, um, Andy Matthews. And Andy, I understand this is your last official duty as chair, yes. or one of them? Yes, that, that's, that's, that's right, Councillor, it is. Thank yep. you. So, um, uh, it's been it's been uh, it's been it's been great. I've, I've very much enjoyed the role in terms of uh, and, and particularly around, I think, supporting Caesar as he's as he's taken on the role of of chief executive and uh, over what's been a particularly challenging time um, for for the cable car, given um, our strong reliance historically on on international tourists, and, and I, I suppose I might just take a, a, a quick opportunity to to make a couple of points that that Caesar may have um, may have focused on um, earlier in his piece that I missed. Apologies for my lateness, but um, one one is I think the and and you would have noticed it in in Caesar's comments that the increased community focus that that we've put on the cable car and uh an, an increased focus on on providing i suppose increasingly for for wellingtonians and their families and and visitors both um in terms of maximizing um the opportunities on, for the cable car as in terms of providing uh transport and and local travel opportunities events and and access um, up into the botanical gardens and and to that end I, I, I do want to stress uh, the appreciation of the board uh, to the council for these financial support that has that has been provided uh, through through the COVID period and uh, accentuated I think by um, the inclusion in the LTP of of funding to support the infrastructure investments that Caesar talked about. 
Uh, and and the, the final point I'd make is that while we've, uh, we've done all we can to ready ourselves for the return of, uh, of hopeful return of, of international tourists, um, it, it, it has really, the, the experience of COVID, I, I think, has, has really uh, made us think about uh, the, the role of the, of the cable car going forward. And it's something that, that I think both uh, the cable car board and, and the council uh, will, will want to keep monitoring, dependent on the degree to which international tourism uh, does, does come back and that becomes, and, 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 and that enables um, a, a level of, of, I suppose, of financial, of increased financial viability for the cable car. As without that, I expect that, you know, we will, we will have to rely on a, a level of, of council support um, to ensure the sustainability of, of what is an icon for Wellington. So thank you, that, those, are my, those are my comments. Happy to answer any questions along with Caesar. Yeah, look, I've got several, and, and thank you. And um, I think it's really um, um, interesting and, and great to see that sort of focus on local communities, you know, the, what the work that you've done in this area. Um, because so often we've seen it as a, a sort of tourist attraction, but actually th it, there's a lot of enjoyment for our local users. And, um, and, and that's something that I think for a lot of our CCOs who are perhaps focused on the tourism market is that there's, this has been an opportunity to reconnect um, with Wellingtonians almost. Um, so just um, want just on that um, local communities attaching, and I'm just thinking about some of the activities our own councillors running around Christmas time, you know, the city events and that. Um, has there been much engagement with the cable car? Um, because if we're trying to, I'm just thinking, we're trying to attract people into the CBD to shop and experience different parts of the CBD whether there's an opportunity to, um, you know, when you're out shopping with the kids on Lambton Key to take a cable car ride. And I, I, I'm just, is, has there been any sort of conversations around that? There, there has been, and we're, so we have already started the conversations and working together on how we can support um, with this year's theme of giving and being able to um, really offer <clears throat> something to to the communities coming in but mm. also using the cable car as a way to get into Lambton Key as well mm. um, for for the events that are planned mm. okay thank you and um, in terms of um, obviously um, with not having the um, the numbers funding what you want to do in the future how is your future investment into the cable car? Um, looking like at this stage? Are you able just to hold things for the next... I mean, it's, it's going to be two or three years before we really, uh, I think, see um, much improvement in, in, in numbers in here visiting Wellington of, of a realistic number. So are you, um, I suppose, are, are you able to still keep operating um, with those cable cars that you have? I think I think there's a couple of there's a couple of points there to make, Councillor. The the cable car, you know, over the over the a number of a number of years, had a strategy of building up financial reserves so that it could meet its own asset renewal requirements and, and effectively fund its infrastructure and, and be self and be self funding. So um, a, as you'll see if you if you look at the the, the cable cars annual report this year that the cable car still has has reasonable levels of of cash holdings the the challenge is about whether those whether those funds uh, are diverted into um, maintaining you know fin ongoing sort of day-to-day -day financial viability which runs down those those amounts for um, for asset renewal etc going forward so which which is which is an option. Um, you know the the other alternative, I suppose, is is that 
continues to provide a level of operational funding support, retains those 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 levels of um, of asset replacement reserves, so that they can be spent on those going forward. So the answer is is, is yes. You know the the um, we we do have sufficient financial reserves to continue. It's just I suppose about overall at, at some stage in the future. Um, there, there will be. A, I expect that there will be some need for for um, ongoing support, one way or another, whether you look at it from a from an asset perspective or an operational perspective. So, from a um, from planning for the, in the future, is is when we start thinking about our next LTP. Is that or is that too soon? Is it this, is it six years away or is it three years away that we should be um, looking at this in particular? Uh, look, I, I, th I think it's probably something that ju is just going to require monitoring, dependent right. on if, you know, yeah. if if international if international tourism opened up in you know within within a year or or within a, within eighteen months, you could you, you know the 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 situation for um, for the cable car could could turn around quite rapidly, you know, mm. in terms of in, in terms of international tourism and and even more so dependent on what happens with the tourist ship market and you know mm. the the um, you know whether whether that market returns or not. So, I, I I really think it's probably going to be a matter of just monitoring monitoring things and you know and the and the quarterly reporting process that we have currently in place is going to give the opportunity for for um, the cable car board and Caesar going forward to keep you updated about about those aspects. Mm. Okay, thank you. And, and just interested about the um, on a separate note, the Waka Katohi funding that was um, that that. Um, was withdrawn. Um, is there any long-term impacts on that, or is it? Um, are you hoping to um, it, for it to come back at a later stage? I um, with with the funding, it was obviously uh, they were oversubscribed. Um, so the the feedback that we got was that they weren't looking at funding seismic resilience projects at this stage and and there was nothing that led us to believe that we will have another crack at that in the near future um, <clears throat> we we have a, a pretty robust asset management plan in place um, we currently don't have anything that's that's critical but we are working on our higher priority items i.e the tunnels and we'll continue to work on all of the items as as we can and as funds become available. Okay, and I'm, I'm assuming that then that's something that as a council we need to be cognizant of for the future if we do need to sort of have a greater funding of, of that work. Okay, all right. Um, um, Councillor Foon, you put your hand up. Um, I haven't got a, a question, Caesar, but I just want to applaud you for all the innovation that's coming out of the cable car. Um, yeah, it's just been really great to watch. And um, yeah, I hope you can keep building on it. But um, just, yeah, thanks so much for that. It's been very, very good fun and definitely put a smile on all of our dials. And, oh. and up, uplifted Council's social media pages. So thanks for that. <laughs> Um, thank you. And just to answer your question, I did say our first wedding and um, I, I was jokingly saying that we have a real opportunity to walk down the aisle in a very unique way here. So watch this space, Councillor Foon. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Caesar, And thank you, Andy. I know it's been a particularly tough time for you as a CCO and, um, and the work that you've had to do to really, um, as Councillor Foon said, the innovation is just amazing. And um, so, look, I, I know you've, um, um, there's still more challenges ahead, um, but, but I, um, and we all discuss this paper tomorrow, but I've got a sense from the round the table that we are highly supportive of what you're doing, and um, we're in we're in this long in this in the long game here. So um, so yeah. thank you, and um, and thank you, um, Andy Matthews, for your co um, contribution and making sure that um, with Caesar's innovation, and I'm sure you're very close eye on the money. Um, it was probably been a very good partnership. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, we. Um
um, we're still on sh pretty much on schedule. So um, we will have, um, we've still got Shane um, there um, from Sky Stadium. Welcome, Shane. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, we were slightly ahead of um, schedule, so um, um, so thank you for, um, I know in the end we delayed you slightly. I appreciate that, thank you. No worries. Okay, so I think we're just loading up your presentation at the moment. Thank you. Very colorful presentation, it's nice to see a yes. bit of color this time of the day. New, new brand guidelines are looking pretty smart. But they are. Um, so that's fine. So thank you, Council. Are you happy for me to just jump in? Yes, please, please start. Sure, no problem. Um, so, look, the past year, and we've discussed this before, um, the past financial year was a year like no other. Um, the events industry worldwide was ravaged by the impact of the global pandemic. Um, and then border closures and alert level changes had a significant impact on the trust business. Um, nonetheless, due to the favorable situation that New Zealand did find itself in relative to the rest of the world, um, we were able to host some great events over the financial year. So just moving on to the next slide, um, the financial year at Atlantis, um, we obviously farewell John Schoen and um, I did pass on the council's thanks that you um, did pass on at the last meeting and he was grateful for that. And of course, we welcome Rachel as the, um, as the new chair. Um, we were able to host 39 major event days. Now, in a normal non-COVID year, we host between 55 to 60 event days. So, um, so it wasn't actually too bad in the end, and it was up from 28 um, in the prior year. Um, we had 290,000 fans attend those events, up from 236,000 the prior year. But it's worth bearing in mind that in the, the, the first 20 years of the stadium, the average attendance we have each year through the stadium is around half a million people. So therein lies the problem in terms of um, you know, revenue levels being nowhere near what they are normally at, in that it's very much a function of how many people um, are attending events and how many events we hold. Um, nonetheless, we were fortunate to be able to have hosted some great events, which I'll just go touch on a little bit more. Um, we made some really good progress on the concourse upgrades. So that's largely complete now with the exception of, um, of recoating the, uh, the floor. Um, we won the best venue of the year for 2019 at the New Zealand Event Awards for the back-to-back -back weekends of Tim Atatini and Eminem um, the prior year. We had, I think, somewhere in the region of, um, you know, close to 80,000 people in over those two weekends with 50% of those visitors coming from outside of the Wellington region. So it was a huge, um, a huge uh, achievement. Um, as we've said before this year, and I've said this a few times, um, this financial year is going to be harder than the one that's been, and, and we're already seeing that. Um, and, you know, being, being at level two means that, you know, there's, there's not a lot of activity that we can run um, of commercial significance at the stadium. Um, but from a positive perspective, the, the event pipeline is very good. And again, I'll talk about that in a moment. So moving on to the next slide. Um, we were able to start the financial year with um, the return of Super Rugby and, and Super Rugby out TRO, which was a great success. Um, I think, um, you know, we're the first country really anywhere in the world to be able to return to events of scale. And uh, it was a bumper year for Super Rugby at, this, at the stadium as we essentially almost held two seasons of Super Rugby within the same um, financial, uh, financial year. Next slide, we hosted the All Blacks uh, Bledisloe Cup um, in October or November, I think it was, later than normal, um, but a, a memorable drawn Bledisloe Cup match, and it was the first international rugby match played anywhere in the world um, since the pandemic started. Uh, next slide, and again, uh, another first for the stadium. It was the first um, stadium concert anywhere in the world um, with 660, which was a fabulous night, and we had 32,000 people um, in for that show, and uh, we look forward to welcoming 660 back in uh, uh, in the first half of next year. And then next slide, and for me, um, uh, you know, we've held much bigger events. We've held events that have probably brought in 10 times the revenue of this particular one, but there's probably not many events I will look back more fondly than the return of the Phoenix um, for that single game um, in, in earlier this year. And 
what was a, a record crowd, a record home crowd for a regular season um, game for the Phoenix and also the largest crowd for any game in the A-League season um, for, for, that, for that season. So that was, a, that was a fabulous night and I'm sure, I'm sure many of you were there and enjoyed it as well. Um, so just looking at the financial performance for the year, um, we recorded a net surplus of $1.415 million compared to a budgeted deficit of $0.86 million. Now that was skewed somewhat by the fact that we received the final payment from the city council towards the concourse upgrade. So if we exclude that grant income, the net loss was $1.54 million. However, we were budgeting, obviously, a loss of 3.67, given um, what, at the time when we were producing these forecasts, um, the future looked, um, you know, really, really, um, really poor. So a lot of this variance is due to just we really cut back in expenses and overheads, um, uh, given the ongoing uncertainties created by COVID, but also the net return from the events that we did host were better than forecast. And we were able to host more events than what we expected to do, which was good. Um, the trust made the first drawdown against the credit facility that was uh, jointly provided by the settlers for a combined, well, we've, we've drawn down 1.8 million um, last financial year of the 4.2 million that was available to us. Um, when that loan was provided to us, we were anticipating that we were going to draw it all down. Um, so obviously the better than expected financial result has meant that we haven't been able to, we haven't had to draw down on all of that yet. Um, we will be drawing down on it this financial year, but what it does mean, at least for the for the foreseeable future, is that we're not coming to the settlers um, requesting further support um, at this stage. So looking ahead, um, the, the first half of next year, the second half of the, the financial year, is actually really healthy at the moment. From the end of January through to the end of April, we've got, I think, 14 weekends of continuous events planned but planned is the operative word, um, given that the outlook is still very, very uncertain. Realistically, we can only operate at, at alert level one. And even at alert level one, we're pretty much confined to domestic content. And a business like ours, when you consider the sport, um, A-League, Super Rugby, NRL, international cricket, international rugby, international concerts, they all require at a minimum a trans-Tasman bubble and ideally open borders um, for us to be able to run on, uh, be firing on all cylinders. So the financial year that we're in now, while last year was better than budgeted, this year will be worse than budgeted. And, um, you know, we took a significant hit in the last few months with the unfortunate loss of both our test matches, the, the Bledisloe Cup and the Argentina Test. Um, we budgeted two concerts for this year, um, two major concerts, and um, the Guns N' Roses one, which has been confirmed, that's moved out into the next financial year and that other budgeted concert is obviously not going to happen. Um, we're not expecting a return to events of commercial significance until February, um, but we have been using this time productively. Um, the team here are spending a lot of time preparing for the new traffic light system and also um, planning for the, the vaccine certificates. Given that um, you know, we host events, um, we are fully expecting that when the sector guidance um, does come out from government, that um, it will mean that um, everybody entering the stadium, it, regardless of whether you're going to be in a working capacity or a patron at the event, will require to be vaccinated, and we're, we're planning for that at the moment. Um, there's very good cause for optimism. Um, look, I can put my hand in my heart saying that if we come out of this, um, you know, some stage next year. Next summer will be the busiest year of events that we will ever have had in Wellington. Um, we've got pencil bookings for a large number of concerts featuring you know, major global artists um, next summer, which is exciting. Um, there will be a surge of content once we get through this. Uh, we have other bookings for major sporting events um, uh, later next year also. And then a big part of the work we're doing at the moment, which is pretty full on, is planning for the FIFA World Cup um, for 2023, which is going to be a massive event when it comes around. We're expecting the, the draw to be announced um, um, quite shortly, which will enable us to, um, to continue to plan, but it is going to be a big event. Um, so as I said earlier on, look, we're not seeking um, further support from settlers at this stage. This year financially will be, will be pretty brutal, but um, we're optimistic that once we get through this phase that um, we will return to calmer waters. 
as I said, we didn't have to draw down on the full loan last year. Uh, we will be doing so for this year's insurance, which is due on the 1st of December. Um, those insurance numbers are, are still pretty hefty. Um, and, you know, I'd argue that they don't provide great value to, um, to the stadium and, and to the settlers, but um, it's something that we, we need to continue to do, obviously. Um, but at least we're not seeing the increases that we have seen um, in previous years, but we're not seeing it declining either. Um, so yeah, the main risk is going to be that if we continue to face significant disruption in 2022, and, and as always, we'll keep settlers fully informed, um, you know, if we do need to have that discussion at some stage next year. So that's a, a brief overview from the stadium. Um, as I said, um, you know, tough trading conditions, but but optimistic once we get through the other side of this. Um, thank you, Shane. Um, I don't see, have we got any qu questions online? No, I think, um, you know, it's a, in, in, in some respects, it's a, it's a sobering story, but it's, it's impacting right across Wellington and, and the country. So, and, um, as um, we were commenting earlier on with our other CCOs, um, look, we really do appreciate the um, the work that you're doing, um, understanding the extra pressures it does place, you know, um, you know, personally and and also from the organisation perspective as well, and how we um, and how organisations are having to continually innovate and rethink um, because you think you're through one aspect and then something else happens. So yeah. Uh, uh, so we, we, we do really appreciate that. And um, and I think the key message from us is that we are in this together. So Yeah. Um, and I think I'll expand on that, Councillor, in that yeah. um, as a group of CCOs, um, all of the CCOs have been very supportive of each other. We do get together regularly mm -hmm. um, and uh, have, a, have a cry at each other's shoulders yeah. as required. <laughs> um, uh, and it, it, the comforting thing about all of this is that um, none of us are in this alone, that everybody mm. is facing the same, um, the same situations and everybody is very supportive. So mm. uh, we're continuing to be grateful um, for the support of both the settlers for the stadium as well. Thank mm. you. Mm. But um, OK, now I've got a question from Councillor Foon. Well, I just thought since no one else was coming in, I could have a little ask. I know that um, Councillor Rush has been getting a bit excited about a a reuse system for all the yummy beers um, that come out at the stadium and other beverages. Are you allowed to release anything about yeah, that? Yeah, we're, we're look, we, we, just we an update. Sure, we haven't um, look. We haven't reached a final um, solution for the region on this yet, but we are working collaboratively with the city council, um, with um, Wellington NZ and the venues team and and uh, the Kapura Group to see if there's an opportunity for all of the, the events industry to collaborate on a reusable system um, and, and maybe one that we can actually manage um, and own um, amongst the group. So that, um, you know, these facilities in terms of on-site facilities and washing and cleaning, you know, can, can be expensive, but if there's an opportunity to here to collaborate in that all of the all of Wellington City can tap into one system that would be quite exciting. So we're exploring that opportunity at the moment. And um, for us at the moment, uh, Councillor Foon, we've um, you know in the last couple of years we've reduced the amount of landfill. I mean, the waste to landfill now, I think of of our of our rubbish is around only twenty five percent is actually going to landfill and. Um, all of those plastic cups that you see at the moment, every single one of those has been recycled locally in, in Wellington, um, but we do want to try and get to that next stage. Um, the other piece of work we're doing in the meantime, um, Hamish Allen and our team, is that we are currently doing some work to actually measure in detail our carbon footprint and with a view to what would it take for us to become um, carbon neutral in coming years. So that's an exciting project and one that we do aspire to. Great. Thank you so much for that, Mahi, and enabling the team to do that. That's great. Thank good you, story, Councilor. too. Thank you. Yeah. A good first. Yes. <laughs> thank you. And Councillor Day? Oh, kia ora. Thank you, Shane. Um, it's really interesting to hear how things are going and how you're trying to um, pivot to um, 
current times. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the amazing mahi that you've done with Te Reo Māori and it's quite exciting when you walk up to the stadium and you're greeted in Te Reo Māori and I just wondered what else is happening in that space because obviously we can always always improve um, and I'm sure that there's plans plans in place to um, you know continue to increase the use in what we see. Um, thank you councillor uh, and that's correct so the the, um, the next step we took um, on that journey was um, we've recorded all of our ground announcements. So um, when you're walking up the Fran Wild Walk, um, all of the announcements are now bilingual, which is fantastic. And um, there's a further piece of work going to be happening between the CCOs and uh, Wellington City Council, um, where we are all getting together quite soon to see how we can collaborate in this area. Um, some of the CCOs are doing wonderful work and are probably ahead of us in that journey. So that's going to be um, a great learning experience for us and we are absolutely committed to doing more in this space. Wonderful, that's really awesome to hear. Thanks, Shane. Thank you. Um, thank you. So um, I think that's, I can't see any other questions. So um, thank you, Shane, for um, sharing um, um, your updates and um, yes, so um, I hope you do get a, a, a decent break over Christmas. Thank you, thank you, Councillor. <laughs> um, thank, you. Um, thank you. So that brings the um, us to the end of the presentations. And Heidi, can I ask that these the presentations themselves get added to the minutes for the fi finance and performance meeting tomorrow? Um, it just means that we've kept them on record because um, some of them were, were good summaries. Um, Okay, is there um, any comments or questions from councillors? Not that I'm expecting any. <laughs> so, okay, look, um, thank you, and um, I'll see you all tomorrow morning. Thank you.